an all-new Dr. Phil. A soldier dying of cancer. I'm fighting for my life right now. Is that why she married their son? I did not marry Kirk for his life insurance money. They claim she's abusive and unfaithful. You had affairs in hopes that he would leave you. I told you I did it so you break up with me. No. Yes, I no. did. She cheats on you. It's You're so matter. judgmental. How's that judgmental? Stay out of my marriage. Let's do it. Is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. I'll try to be an emotional compass and point you in the right direction. Five, four. I am not giving up on you. think that the worst thing in the world a parent could possibly hear is that their son is dying of cancer. But after Lori and Kirk Sr. learned their beloved son was battling stage four liver cancer, they say the news actually got worse. Because these grieving parents found out that the woman who once left their boy at the altar was back. They said the minute star, who they call the money-hungry bride, heard her fiancé only had six months to live, she ran, not walked him down the aisle. Take a look. My son was diagnosed with a rare form of liver cancer. They gave him six months to live. My son has a life insurance policy through the military for $500,000. I believe Star was seeing dollar signs with my dying son. She married him for his life insurance money. She has put him through living health. Star is manipulative, and she is out for Star. Star has physically, emotionally, and financially destroyed my son. Star has cheated on Kurt multiple times. Star has physically attacked my son over 10 times. At the reception, she punched him in the nose. Star has left marks on his body. Star has hit him in the face. He had to call the police to get help. She emotionally is abusive. She made him believe that he was fat. And then when he lost all the weight from being sick, she tells him nobody would want him because he's not even a man. Seeing the pictures that I've seen him post on Facebook, he looks very thin, gaunt, and very weak. He's called me in tears saying, Dad, I've made a horrible mistake. If I do something, I don't get a thank you, nothing from her. Nothing. Not a damn thing. I believe Star is isolating Kirk from his family. I haven't seen my son for nine months. All right, are you OK? We only hear from Kirk when he needs money. Kirk, when he needs to get to treatment, when he needs food. When she said, I do, she was very much aware that he had stage four cancer. I want him to find somebody that loves him. But I don't believe that this woman feels that for him. My biggest fear is my son's going to die all alone. OK. Um tough situation obviously I mean just the disease itself is bad enough and um, I'm sorry to hear this is a, a, a rare form of liver cancer correct mm -hmm. there's like 200 cases a year worldwide from mm -hmm. what I understand yes um, and I understand that it is a terminal disease mm -hmm. and he's in stage four of four yes um, now, he was given six months to live but that was three years ago he was living with his mom, and his mom was helping him fight this, this disease. And then all that went to hell after, after this uh, woman came into his life. Okay, so you've seen him deteriorate, in your opinion. He's lost weight. He's, he's on a downslide. Yes. Yes. And is his tumors she, have grown. And you say she's not taking him to treatment? He won't have the money because he will use his money on her. You know, on other things. So, so he, he has money have... for the treatment itself because he's a veteran. Correct. But Correct. he doesn't have the money to get there. It's a nine-hour trip. Yes. Yes. Um, is there some reason he's not living closer to a treatment center? Because she decided, they decided, that they were going to move to Arkansas. Okay, now, they were going to get married in 09, correct? Yes, previously they were. Yes. And 
did she not show up for the wedding? She did not show up. No. You mean literally didn't did show up at the show altar, up. left him standing at the altar? Left him. Then in 11, he gets diagnosed with the cancer and is given six months prognosis, yes. right? But they don't get married until 14 when he reconnects with her. They re reconnected in June and they were uh, married by November. Okay. Now, at that time, she knew of the disease. Yes. Okay, so she knew what she was getting into. Yes. And did you tell us that she physically attacked him at the reception of the wedding? She physically attacked the whole reception. <laughs> I mean... I got a phone call from, my, from Kirk's brother. He says, Dad, you're not going to believe what just happened. Star stood up, flew across the reception hall, lunged in the air, and jumped on my fiancé and started pounding her in the face. I tried to pull her off. Then she started hitting me. She continued on hitting people throughout this, the three. This is his new wife. This, this is, is her, his wife. This is their married wedding day. Now. This Very is her stuff. wedding day. Yes. Okay. And, and then she attacks Kirk. Yeah. Through the, through the process, yes, she hits Kirk. And, and all this time, my son's sitting in a ball on the floor, crying his eyes out because his wedding day has been ruined. What does she say about this? Does she, does she deny this? No, she does not deny it. Two months later, you get in a physical altercation with her. We went out for New Year's Eve. We came home. I walk out of the bedroom, and she did the same thing to me. She flew across the kitchen and attacked me. So you're concerned that she's being physical, physically abusive with your son, and, and mentally abusive, yes. emotionally abusive, and that she's cheating on him. Yes. Yes. And she admits that she's cheated on him. Yes. Yes. Okay. And... You say he was a proud and strong man at one point. He was very but proud. she's broken him down. I, yes, she's broken him. She has broken him. Physically, emotionally, yes. financially. Look at him. I, you know, I, <laughs> Look he, at my son, pictures of my son. Right. He wasn't that way a year ago. This woman has broken him down to nothing. And, you know, he, he, he went as far as getting a, a shadow box and putting all of his medals that he had received from the Army. She took that shadow box and smashed it in a million pieces. When they were moving from Michigan to Arkansas, his mother found that she had thrown several of his medals in the garbage bag out for the garbage. And the rest of them were in the kid's play chest. That's how much she thought of, of our son's service in the military. Well, so who are we talking about here? Uh, up next, Lori and Kirk are gonna sit across from and talk with their son and his wife, Star, for the first time in several months. Star says she is not the villain in this family drama. We're going to find out who she thinks is the real problem when we come back. I'm fighting for my life right now, but at times I'm living a life of hell. I feel stuck in the middle between my wife and the family. Star did not marry me for my insurance policy. Their theory was that I thought Kirk was going to die within two months after we got married. I'm not that evil. I want my family to butt out. Monday on an all-new Dr. Phil. I believe that I've written hundreds of songs for multiple artists. Is he a liar? Do you believe he wrote Shake It Off? I do. Taylor Swift doesn't believe he wrote the song. Delusional. You're walking in the neighborhood, talking to yourself, playing your guitar with no shirt. You're screaming in a restaurant, I miss Taylor. That's definitely odd behavior. Or a master manipulator. You and I know you didn't write those songs, right? All new Dr. Phil. That's Monday. Star has two daughters from a previous relationship. She makes Kirk take care of the children and do chores around the house. He's in no condition to watch the two little girls. I believe the negativity and working and being stressed out is going to contribute to his death. Well, Lori and Kirk Sr. claim their terminally ill son, Kirk, was thriving in their care until he married Star. They say Star wanted nothing to do with their son until she found out he was dying of cancer. And then she married him to get his life insurance money. Star denies marrying Kirk for his money and has some choice words for and about his parents. Kirk's family has judged me since day one. They make me out to be this evil person that's just after his money and his benefits. I did not marry Kirk for his life insurance money. 
Their theory was that I thought Kirk was going to die within two months after we got married. I'm not that evil old person. I'm sorry. I did not stand Kirk up at the altar. If I stood him up at the altar, then how are we married now? I knew that he had terminal cancer before I married him. They accused me of cheating on him before I even cheated on him. I cheated on Kirk twice. I got fed up with the whole relationship, and I just wanted to find a way out. I did hit Kirk once. We got into an argument. He said some really hurtful things, calling me a bad mom, calling me crazy, and I apologized after that. There's the wedding party. How does it make you feel when you look at these? It makes me happy. And Star? That's, that's what I mean. <laughs> yeah, makes me happy. I don't think it does. I wasn't trying to upset him. I don't know why he just got upset. We dated for a couple of months before we even got married anyways. I think we both should have just waited a little while. Lori is the one that's money hungry. Lori is hostile towards me. She threatened to kill me. Lori and I did get into a fist fight on New Year's Eve. She blamed me for Kurt being skinny, blamed me for destroying him. And next thing you know, we were fighting. Kurt tackled me to the ground. It hurts my feelings. The last thing I want is for his family to hate me. Kurt's family is trying to destroy our marriage. They need to back off. Okay, glad y'all are here. I'm sorry to hear that you're ill and dealing with this. You've not seen your parents in several months, correct? I haven't seen my dad in about seven and my mom in about two, two months. Mm -hmm. And um, what's your relationship with your parents at this point? How would you um, describe it? We started getting along and talking again. Right. I know my mom, my mom and my dad want the best for me. They worry about me a lot. Right. Um, a lot of times, like, I was in the Army for nine years, two tours to Iraq, lived in Germany for most of that. I'm a grown man, and when there's problems happening between me and Star, that's our marital problems. And I just feel like sometimes I'm being pulled in each direction, being caught between my wife and my family. Like, my, my biggest wish is for all of us to come out of here, you know, get along, maybe sit down for a Thanksgiving dinner, be happy, see the kids running around. That's what I want for this. Before it slides by on behalf of myself and the millions of people watching this now and the people in the audience, uh, let me say thank you for your service in Iraq the two times that you've been. Very, very much, very much appreciate that. Uh, Star, you've heard them say not very flattering things about you and have described you in a... I get it all the time. Uh, ...described you in a way that uh, seems as though you, uh, for one thing, uh, are a very combative individual. Uh, is that true? When I drink vodka, I have known to get a little hostile, but, I mean, I don't get that way unless people, like, push me into that direction. Did you attack people at your wedding reception? It was uh, Kirk's brother, or brother's girlfriend. Well, that's really not an essay question. D did you attack people well, at your... Well, I did, but yeah. she... Only that person. At your wedding reception? Yeah. Okay. Has she physically attacked you? We've gotten physical, yeah, a couple times. You say you do everything to care for Kirk. Yeah, I've been taking him to his appointments once a month. I believe last month it was once a week. And on top of that, I'm trying to take care of my two kids and take care of everything around the house. Plus, trying to keep a job and I'm doing all these things and that's you think a lot they should be grateful and why well, yes they should be grateful because I'm not doing what they're accusing me of I worked on my own I was a single mom for four years I got my own place my own car had my job for two years almost three years why would I throw all that away to go up there and be such an evil person why would I do that well, that's what we've been trying to figure out for quite a while well it doesn't make we sense want to know me. why 
Well, that's why? His because mother says says you, that's when wrong. you married Kirk, did you know that you were going to have to take him to chemo? When yes, you married I knew. him, did you the know that you were going to have to take him to chemo? was so he could be was not a surprise answer. he had cancer, he was it? I know it wasn't. It was not. I have a mother that has cancer, too. I also lost the son, Lori. You don't think this is a lot on me? Time out, time out, time out. This is why I didn't even want to come on here. Okay, well, hold on. We're just, we're not going to, you know, Kirk, you're right, and we're not going to do that. Uh, let's take a break. And uh, coming up, Star does admit that she's cheated on Kirk. In fact, she says she might do it again. Does she want to stay married to Kirk or does she not? Because what I'm interested in is what he wants. Because frankly, I'm not really concerned about what anybody else wants at this point. I'm interested in what he wants and getting him what he wants. We'll be right back. It's hurts you that she's cheated on. More than anything. You owe him the truth. And you said... I know Star has cheated on me several times with one man and one time with another man. It makes me angry. Me and Star don't even sleep in the same bed together anymore. There's no affection. The fights between me and Star have gotten physical. She did give me a bloody nose. Star has said things out of anger. She said, I wish cancer would take you. Tired of not getting any sentiment from her. No love, no emotion, nothing. I told her how could she say that to her husband. I love Star more than I've loved anybody in my entire life. If we're just being honest, you might be in this world for three more months or three more years. You don't know, right? I mean, none of us know, but you're at higher risk for being short-term than people in general. Mm -hmm. That's the truth of it, right? Mm -hmm. People may think, wow, Dr. Phil's being kind of harsh here, but you and I know that's the, reality. that's the truth. You know it. I know you know it. And my attitude is when you're in that situation, I kind of hold two things near and dear. One is living and dying with dignity, and the other two is being kind of selfish. You know, you ought to kind of do what you think you ought to do and what you want. And that's what I'm interested in. And I heard you say you love Star with all your heart, but it's hurts you that she's cheated on you. More than anything. Uh-huh. Uh, and you have cheated on him, right? Yes, I have. More than once. Twice. Uh-huh. And um, you, I have to say, you seem... With regard to him, you seem pretty cold and dispassionate, frankly. Uh, it just seems... I mean, let's just be honest. Because, uh, it, 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 because of what I said to him, if, in fact, he's at high risk and doesn't have a lot of time, you don't have the right to waste his time. I'm not trying to waste his time. I'm just, I'm just being honest, right? Let's be honest. I don't need any help from you two right now. I don't need any help from you two, and he doesn't want to have a screaming match here. You owe him the truth. And before you answer... Do you love me? You need to... I, I said dignity. You need to afford the man dignity. You need to be honest about where you are. You, you, want, to, you want to tell the truth. And, Kirk, you want the truth, do you not? W where are you here? I feel like I love him, but I also feel like a lot of it's faded between everybody getting into our relationship. I'm not asking you why you feel the way you feel. I'm asking you what you feel. I feel like it's faded. Do you think that we could work on it from here and repair our relationship? I think, I think it's time to end it. I think it's best that we just go our separate ways. You, you've told us you think you have the right to be happy, too. Well, sure. I mean, I shouldn't have to live the rest of my life with that over my head and getting blamed for stuff I'm not doing. I'm not, how am I destroying him? How did, I'm being blamed for dragging him halfway across the country. This isn't to get away about from his him. Family. This is about you and Kirk. 
Are you... It, if they the, butt out, Star, and they don't get into our marriage and you leave us alone... Like stop? I'm just saying, if that were to happen, would you want to work things out, stay with me, and I go believe, on from here? I believe you should be closer to your family and spend the last days with them. Star, um, again... I'm asking you to be totally honest here. Are you involved with someone else right now? No, I'm not. Are you in the early stages of being involved no. with someone else right no. now? No, I'll probably be homeless and everything after it's all done, said and done, but I don't care. I, I think that's just what's best for both of us. He should be with his family. I'm not trying to keep him from his family, and I wouldn't want that on anybody. And The truth is, you've had affairs was, in hopes that he would leave you because you didn't want the guilt of leaving someone that was sick. Did you do that in part so he would end this relationship and you would not yes. have to? I didn't want to hurt his feelings. I've so, asked you always to be honest with me. I'm trying to be as honest. Well, now you are. I was honest with you then. I told you I did it so you'd break up with me. No. Yes, I no, did, because, Kurt. Because, no. Because, yes, I no. did. Or let me talk. I asked you about, are you contacting the guy that, that you cheated on? That has nothing to do with it. Listen to me. And you All said... Right, <laughs> and she said that she wants to move on and work on this because she loves me and she thinks we can move on and be happy together. She cheats on you. You're right. She treats you like crap. There's two sides to her. Kirk, do you watch the girls? When okay. she's at work, I, I You're a dad I, and you I take care not, of the girls, don't I you? Not, I don't have a clue what you two are trying to achieve right now. I do have some things to achieve. We'll be right back. He wouldn't let me drink out of any cup. He wouldn't even let me use the bathroom. You can't catch cancer. Not Shame wrong. on you people. Are you ready to make history? Because I have a big, huge announcement to share with you today. You know what, Anthony? I'm going to need you to get up from that seat and get out. Yep. Bye-bye. Okay. I have teamed up with Omaze, and I'm inviting you to sit right here, that, that's right, in this empty chair. As my special guest, you and a friend will fly out to Los Angeles, get all glammed up, and join me here on the set for a very special taping of the Dr. Phil Show. But that's not all. Here's where we make history. At the end of the show, you will become the first fan ever to join me and Philip on national television for our signature walk-off. That's right. So start practicing your walk because millions of supportive viewers will be watching. We are going to have a ball. This will be so much fun. And the best part of all is that all entries support my foundation, Win Georgia Smile, and our efforts to help victims of domestic abuse and sexual assault live healthy, safe, and joy-filled lives. Enter to win by donating. Go to omaze.com slash Robin. That's O-M-A-Z-E dot com slash Robin. My mom can't cope with the fact that she's not the sole caregiver anymore. Once Star got in the picture, she's tried everything to sabotage me and Star's relationship. And even before Star, any girl that was interested in dating me, she said that I'm too sick to handle a relationship. I'm tired of my mom trying to control my life. Before the break, uh, Star uh, chose to leave. She has chosen to come back at this point. Before the break, I also said to the parents, I don't know what y'all are trying to achieve by arguing about what has happened. All we can do is focus on what does happen. 
It's just been really frustrating. I see him suffer, and, and I know he really wants a relationship, and he deserves that. And, and he deserves to be loved. I, I've, I've tried to support him and, and be well, there. How can you say he have that, a relationship when you all don't even let him? He says you don't even want him you don't even living see with the you because you're afraid be that he's going to continue. And I deserve to be home. loved and feel happy and all when that. He first, he does love you. Please. Well, when he first got sick, um, we had little children, you know, five and five years old at right. home. And uh, um, they put him on chemo, an external pack. And uh, my concern was that if that ruptured or something, that it would make the little ones sick. The warning is that you are supposed to take precautions. So th that was the only reason I why I didn't want him in the home. And my oncologist, and he said it was no threat to anybody you, or my you family. You can't catch cancer. Not the it cancer, cancer. The, the radiation from the chemo. What happened was he wouldn't let me drink out of any cups. I had to drink out of plastic cups. I had to eat off plastic silverware and plates. He wouldn't even let me use the bathroom. That's not true, Kirk. You said don't use the bathroom. I don't I want said, you to use contaminate the downstairs anything. bathroom. I was told that there's a possibility of, of radiation. When I went to pick up my stuff, you said don't chemo use the bathroom. Can, 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 chemo can, can, can My mom can contest I was told yeah. that, and that's what I, I asked him. I said, You weren't well, told we, that by my oncologist who specializes in my This is before I even talked to your doctor, Kirk. And I asked him if he wouldn't mind eating off of a paper plate and a plastic, you know, disposable How do you think disposable that makes me feel? utensils until we find out more about this. Because it was all new to me, and I didn't know. So why are you turning this against I'm just, just, was three your dad years who's ago, been Kirk. there for you since you've gotten sick? He's your, just your telling dad you that's how it, to, he's to, just telling you, you know, how you feel you, at you know? the time. I'm just telling you how it makes I know, but time, son, yeah. come on, you know. But after, a, after that, that after I found out everything, learned. I was uneducated, Dr. Phil, about the situation. I'll be honest. And I was scared. And he was going just to told his son was going to die in six months. You know? We're looking at our son. Mom, when we went you to my dad's back a minute. work, you were you more than back upset. A when you're told you admit your child. That. You need to admit your that. Child. To tell my dad how you felt. But you do step day. back when you're told that your child, especially you need a to male, tell my dad how you has felt to step back that and day say, and "Whoa, you, were you know what I mean? Detach Be for a second. I believe that's what he was doing. He was looking at his son dying, being no, told he's no, only be got honest. six months to live. Be honest what you, you what were saying. What is the parent supposed to do? Well, be honest what, what you were saying to do? and how you of felt that day. Of course I was day. upset. But I took myself out of the situation, stepped back, and looked at it and said, you know what? This man was just told his son was dying. You were afraid. Look, now, just what you are now, Kirk. And I'm being blamed for you being skinny. That's you not don't true. Eat and Would anybody? I've been blamed for you having cancer, so I don't. Know she says you need to. It's everybody else's Kurt. fault, right, Star? You need how to. Do I it's everybody else's cancer. fault, but you. No, I have as taken as blame for my stuff. I just don't understand how I can give someone you cancer. You're living your life. You. I have taken you're responsibility. You're living your life, and you I admitted to what I said. What that did. I admitted to my fault. It's not shame on you, people. How is that even selfish? Will you people all just shut up, please? Is anybody, you, don't shoot your eyes at her. You want to say something, say it to me. Does anybody here, I don't know, have a passing question about what maybe they could do to help Kirk? Anybody? Curious? If that's why we're that's here. That's why we're I here. Would, really? Yeah. I Thank thought you. you were here to bicker and defend yourself and point fingers at one another. That's what it seems like it's Nobody's happened, asked right? a question Thank of me. You. Nobody has posed a question. Have you asked me, is there anything I, as his mother, can do to help and facilitate his journey? I haven't heard you ask. I sure haven't heard you ask. I haven't heard anybody ask me that question. That's why so I think I'll phone. pose it as a hypothetical and answer it right after the break. She's looking for the door. If she didn't want to work things out, I just wish that she didn't have to take me on the Dr. Phil show for her to say that. Monday on an all-new Dr. Phil. 
Is he a famous songwriter? Do you believe he wrote Shake It Off? I do. Taylor Swift doesn't believe he wrote the song. Or delusional. You're walking in the neighborhood, talking to yourself, playing your guitar with no shirt, right? That's Monday. I'm back with a very difficult situation, and uh, Kirk, Lori, let me let me be very honest about one thing. I don't know how you feel. And in a sense, that's a good thing because it's kind of like coming through the forest and seeing the two of you down in a deep, dark hole. I can't help you if I jump down there with you because now we're all three in a deep, dark hole. It's good that if I'm still up here on the ground where I can go for help or throw you a rope or have a different point of view and see things that maybe you can't see because you're so emotionally up against it. I, I love my son so much. Of course. It's, that's so hard to deal with. You, you just can't imagine. I'm so proud of him. I am so proud of my son. My son is my hero. And I love him so much. And it just tears me up inside to see him, you know, just waste away like this. He deserves to be in a situation where somebody cares and loves about him, even if that person is not perfect. Well, Kirk, I want to, um, I want to talk to you objectively here and, and tell you, and I'm not here to demonize that's what I don't want. Star. I don't want her to be a villain in this. But she has told you in her words today and her behavior leading up to today that she is not committed to this relationship in, in a loving and devoted way. And I believe in reciprocity, in relationships that you, you should get what you give i know she loves me it's just i just feel dis i don't even know what to feel about it all honestly i feel like i got in like, over my head with the whole thing you got to put in to your marriage on all aspects mm -hmm. you know what i mean and if i can't contribute in that way even mowing the lawn that's the man's job i can't even mow the lawn she does it it, it upsets me. If she didn't want to work things out and she was feeling this way, I just wish that we didn't have to go on the Dr. Phil show for her to say that. I, 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 thought, I thought that we were coming on here to mend our relationship, get everyone to get along, and move on so we both all can be happy here. What I know is... I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to tell you I see B when I see A. Mm -hmm. As I'm peeling back the layers here, and I, 93% of all communication is nonverbal, and I'm reading her like a book, and she's looking for the door. She doesn't want to hurt you. She doesn't want you to be hurt by anyone, but she also knows that she's emotionally bankrupt in this deal. She says, I'm over my head. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I, I don't want to seem like a witch, you know, deserting a, a, a dying man here, but I got nothing. And that's what she's telling you. Star, true? This is true. Very true. My advice for this family when we come back. Do you need Dr. Phil's help? Text Phil to 88500 and share your story for a chance to appear on the show. Standard message and data rates may apply. show without you, our studio audience. If you are going to be in the Los Angeles area and you would like free tickets, go to drphil.com and click on Be in the Audience. Because we have a lot of fun here, don't we? Or you can call 323-461-PHIL. That's 323-461-7445.
your wife is telling you that she can't give you what you want from her. And no matter how we got here, we are where we are. And your question is, Star, are you willing to work on this? That's your question, right? Yeah, if, if, if she truly loves me, she wants to work on it. Star, do you feel that you have a, a deep abiding love inside for him that if certain obstacles were removed that you two could live together as a couple happily ever after? Yeah. I just hope that this helps. I'm sorry? I just hope it all helps. Uh, well, that's a different answer than you gave me before. Because before you said, no, I it's just fading. And don't I don't see how I'm supposed to live gone. the rest of my life being happy with someone. Three more years, ten more years, you that's know? That's when you make the best of it, Star. I know, but how am I supposed to make the best out of it when your family's over here accusing me of several things? I agree with you. I can't live happy. No. You know, Star, I, I guess I'm asking you um, if, if, um, if, if you can in good faith say with professional help that you can commit yourself to this relationship, that you, you have love for Kirk, that you can be faithful to him and nurturing to him and a, a partner with him and that these can be goals that you can in good faith embrace then then you need to say so and I will make those resources available to you if your position is you know what I'm past that I've already moved on I, I just haven't known how to tell him. It's either one or the other, and you, you want to know the truth, right? Do you think we can move on from this? If not, say so. I want to. I just don't see anything changing. So, I mean, if it's going to stay the same, then no, I don't want it to. Or don't want to. Because I, I don't deserve that either. I, I agree. You don't deserve to be attacked. Let me intercede here because I'm, I, I started this by saying I'm interested in what you want. You want to explore if there's a possibility to rehabilitate this relationship. Yes. That's what you want and that's yes. what we're going to do. And she flip-flops, she says something one time and then the next time she says something else. How has that worked out for you? It's worked out. At times, yeah. For you and a couple other guys along the way. To get something off your chest, sign up for the DrPhil.com community and weigh in on your favorite episodes and share your personal stories with other community members. Plus, get started on your own blog to share your thoughts on the topics that interest you most. I'll be reading those message boards. Log on to DrPhil.com today. She's willing to give this a, a, a shot if they will disengage and not continue this rancor and dialogue and they're willing to do that while I step in here and bring some professional help and take a look at this. They're yes. willing to do that, correct? Yes. You guys willing to move on? You're willing to let me step in here, y'all? Yes. That's, you, all, that's what we're here for. Because what the, you're doing ain't to, working. To come to, to come to a resolution. Because what y'all doing? What, what have working. I been doing now? No, I'm just saying. What? Then, then you got nothing no, to stop. No, I can't get through to him. He okay. won't listen. Take listen to anybody. Okay. Then you, then you got nothing to lose. And so she, you just she flip flops. She's got one. She says something one time, and then the next time she says something else. Just We're like willing she does for just you now. to do what you got to do. I'll back so. off and, and starting. He doesn't want a relationship with his dad. We already have months ago. See, that's starting. Starting now. Thank you. He said. 
let me let me do this for a while. He said he doesn't want a relationship. He said I don't want a relationship with my dad. He's mad that I want to no, work. Kirk, you just with said that. No, you no, said... You, come on, come on, give me give me I'll a shot. You have your family give me a me. shot here. See, okay? see what I mean? Now he's yeah, give me a shot. Now, now there's give me a problems shot. Caused. I'm just really frustrated. No, I, I get that. Be frustrated. Go You need to respect go my butter decisions, stump or something, Dad. but let me let, no, you haven't. Can we ask you a question, Dr. Phil? You Can said don't talk question? to me until you, you break up with that A question, Dr. Bitch. Phil? Mm -hmm. That was your exact What do we words. do? Because we have. What do we I've do when he calls us for financial help? To be a wife to for help. You. How has that worked out for you? It's worked out at times, yeah. For you and a couple other guys along the way. See what I mean? You're so judgmental. I'm not. How is that you're judgmental? You're so judgmental. How is that judgmental? Because you're it's pointing the truth. fingers every time. It's not pointing the truth. It's the truth, Kurt. Help me when you can. I'm sorry, Dr. Phil. I, I'm just going to ask you guys to let me stand in your shoes for just a little while here. Let me step in and bring some professionals in here and and get some help. I appreciate G give it. Me, give me 30 days. G give me 30 days to just okay. zip it. And, and let me and let me see what can happen. That's what he wants to do. She's willing to take a shot. I want to do what he wants to do. You don't say that you don't want to talk to me because I'm. I'm not saying with... that. You just said that if I get my mom and my dad out of my life, then will you love me? Dr. I did not I'm say not out of my life. for them to be out of your life. How I say respect my decisions. Stay, my decision. stay out of my marriage. Stay out of my marriage. I'm going to get it's some. my marriage. I'm I don't get, get in some, your marriage. I'm going to get some professional help here. I don't make here. opinions about your marriage. I'm going to get some professional help here. You're my here. son. And that professional help. And you're help, my dad. And that professional <laughs> help. <laughs> that professional <laughs> help is going to wall them off from that. Okay? Gonna wall them off from that. I'm here to try to help them and keep it back in here. Okay. I'm gonna wall them off from that. Okay. And uh, and then if progress is made in that, then y'all are gonna be part of that at some point. Yes, but we love our son. At this point, yes. venting That's what I want. is is not helping. So right now you're gonna let me stand in your shoes and and I'm gonna work with them about that, okay? Thank Fair you. enough. Thank you. And then we'll work Appreciate on this. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. we'll work on this. Okay, sir? Yeah. All right, I want to thank all of my guests today. If you're caught in a family drama and want my advice, go to drphil.com and tell me about it, I think. <laughs> um, we will see you next time. Thanks, guys. Dr. Phil. My husband degrades me every single day. Just go kill yourself, loser! I hate your guts! They vowed. I felt obligated to marry Julie. He married you out of pity. To love and to cherish. But I've never put my hands on you. You just said it that you should be. For richer, for poorer. I don't really like you. Your attitude sucks. For better, for worse. You're just killing me! I think you're a loudmouth bully when you're behind closed doors. Let's do it. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. This is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. I'll try to be an emotional compass and point you in the right direction. Five, four. I am not giving up on you. to meet a husband who believes a marriage should be treated like a business and has half-jokingly said a perfect wife should be mute. <laughs> Paul says he married his girlfriend Julie back in 2011 out of pity. <laughs> and he thought it was a good business opportunity until about three years ago when he says Julie became a burden. He describes her as a bull in a china shop breaking everything in a house from the DVD player to dinner plates to doors. When it comes to vehicles, 
She is a car crash, literally. Paul says she has been in six accidents in five years. But the last time she crashed the car, he screamed that she was an idiot who should only be allowed to ride a horse. Here's some of that reaction. I told you to stop taking a car to the wall anyway. You can't even operate a car like that. You need a horse. I'm so sick of you. Go the away from me. Just go kill yourself, loser. And I hate you. Well, Julie says that's not all that rare. She says Paul calls her a moron a lot. She says he's changed from being a loving partner to a hostile, abusive husband who treats her worse than he treats the dogs. He even sided with his son when Julie says the teen cut her finger with his dad's machete. Now, Paul says this whole marriage is a business plan has backfired, and he wants to know if he should cut his losses now. My husband, Paul, degrades me every single day. I felt obligated to marry Julie. She really, really wanted me to. Now I feel a little bit of resentment towards it because Julie makes me feel like I'm just a frustrated monster all the time. I'm just sick of you! Paul has grabbed me by the neck, thrown a nail in my face, thrown a glass of water in my face, punched walls. Julie instigates fights, argues with me. She nags about things. Sometimes I do have to tell Paul four or five times to do something. 99 times I'm good. It's the 100. It's just too much. Tell her to shut up. Go the f away from me! She was constantly breaking things in the house that I had to fix. So this is what it takes to operate the Blu-ray player. That's all you do. This is the way Julie operates the Blu-ray player. Until the thing's broken. When things stop working around the house, Paul blames it on me and says it's my fault. Well, so here's how Julie uses the remote. Julie's horrible at handling finances. In the last two years, I bet she's overdrawn the count at least 50 times. It seems like bad things do happen to me, and it's not my fault. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I'm married to a child. She's more of a burden than a wife. Okay. Uh, charming. You've been together 13 years. You've been well, married five. Yeah. We've been married almost five years, yes, sir. Yeah. Why are you staying together if you make each other this miserable? Because I love him and I want it to work. I want to fix this. That's why I'm here. If, if you think she's such a burden, why have you not unburdened yourself? You know, it hasn't always been this way. For the past couple of years, it's been pretty intense, though. And I just, I don't want to quit. You know, I don't, I don't want to just, because I feel like it, it's, it's some give and take here. You know, I, obviously, I have some things I could improve on, but we really need to get... Uh -huh. down to some accountability for a few things so that we can right. move forward. And I, I think these are fixable. If why I didn't, did you, then why I Why did you marry her? Because I do love Julie. I do. Well, you told us that you married her because you felt obligated. Well, we've been together a long time. And, y you know, at some point, I, I did feel a little obligated, but I also do love Julie. Well, here, here let's just listen to what you said. I felt obligated to marry Julie. She really, really wanted me to. And now I feel a little bit of resentment towards it. Sometimes I feel like I'm married to a child. She's more of a burden than a wife. There it is. There it is. I don't make this stuff up. How do you feel about that? I'm sad. <laughs> Why are you laughing? I'm, yeah, because I'm, I'm shocked. But you shouldn't have married me out of burden. He didn't marry you out of burden. He married you out of pity. But he said he felt obligated though. because he had been with you for so many years that he felt like you were respecting him too, and so he felt like he just kind of had to do it. I married you because I was in love with you. Remember the first night we met? I'm embarrassed. I'm sorry. Well, no, I understand. You can't change what you don't acknowledge. And I like to get everything on the table to see where we are. I made a list of all the complaints that he told us about you and all the ones you told us about him because those become a to-do list, right? And his complaints about you are that you instigate fights, that you bring conflict and instability to the marriage, no courtesy for Paul's thoughts that you nag, never apologize or takes blame, has overdrawn bank account over 50 times, 15 jobs in a year, crashed six cars, breaks the remote control, DVD players, so negative that he can't have the sun, at the house. Well, the son's not at the house, and you know why. Does he attack you with a machete? Yes, absolutely. 
A while back, my son was visiting me on the weekend, and I was at work, and Julie said he got out of hand and swung a machete at her. Paul's son had the machete in his hand, and he was waving it just like this. Stay away from me, stay away from me. Julie called me on the phone. It was getting crazy. He cut her, and she was crying. He physically violated me and purposely took that machete out underneath our bed. I do believe that you were hurt. I don't believe that he hurt you. Okay. It wasn't it was certainly intentional. There's our disrespected problem. My son's a straight and narrow kid. He makes straight A's. He's a vegan. He's, he's, he's just a good kid. I just didn't believe that it went down like that. This was violently insane. Sure, sham, shing, three times. I have three cuts on my hand. It was lacerated here to the bone. He said that he was in my room with the machete in his hand, and Julie came in and grabbed the machete and snatched it out of his hand and cut herself. Paul didn't punish his son at all for it. Julie said I had to make a choice between her or my son. She wanted me to completely believe her and put him in jail. But that's not going to happen. I felt so disrespected. Julie brings on the drama. I mean, you can't treat me that way. And now your son thinks it's okay to treat me that way. Like, be violent with me. I mean, beat me up. You can't be physically violent with a lady. Now your son thinks it's okay to do it. Did the son have the machete and he was waving it around? Yes, sir. Did you rush in and try to take it away from him? Uh, no, I was begging him to put it down. He whooped it out underneath the covers and I was like oh my gosh I was begging him just like this Paul please put it down and he went ch -ch -ch. and what did he say that I provoked the son to do it and um that uh and he was he's even thought that I did it to myself <laughs> um you thought you I just found this out cut herself to create drama for the record, I didn't take anyone's side. Uh, you put me in the middle of that situation, and you got to know, I've known this kid since he was a baby, and he's never done anything like this. Okay. However, you, on the other hand, will push a lot of buttons to get attention, and I just thought, you know, maybe there's some truth to both sides. I was sick of it. You know, I was sick, I was, I was sick about it. How do you, you handle something You can't allow like your that? son to cut your gosh darn wife. You see this? I'm allowing this is I wasn't Yes, even you there. have. You didn't discipline him. You didn't, I mean... You can't be just the weakened father. You have to stand up. She and said that. This is kind but of I'm a big your wife. Deal. You should you should back me up. I'm a 47 year old woman, and it's a 15 year old child. Okay. The outcome is. Uh, we've got to take a break. Uh, Julie has a list too. Uh, so there's sure. been 900 fights uh, in the last five years, according to her, and she says he's been aggressive from the start. Kicked her out of the house and beat her with a shoe. According to her, when we come back, two years ago, Julie called the police on Paul, but the police decided it was her that needed to be arrested. She'll tell us why when we come back. Paul and I got in a very heated fight. Just go kill yourself! That's when he pushed me up against the wall with my neck. You were pretty upset and you were right in my face and I, I may have, maybe I did push you a little hard, but you were right in my face. Paul tried to strangle me. And later... You had to go on TV to do that? Yep. Okay. I've been listening to you yell and scream at her in a highly abusive way, so yeah, I think you did have to come on TV to do that because I think you're a loudmouth bully when you're behind closed doors. Tomorrow on an all-new Dr. Phil... Your parents asked us to escort you to Dr. Phil. I don't need help. She's beautiful. We don't want you in jail. Why would I end up in jail? Because you're breaking the law. And out of control. You're not going to class. I can't go. I can't. This young man is autistic. Have you bullied him? No, I love that kid. You say she's made you take her shopping and get her nails done. I tried to say no, but she gets threatening. That's tomorrow. Three years ago, I found Paul's phone. Paul was texting at least about 50 messages back and forth. They were discussing what they were wanting to do with each other sexually. I was disgusted. When I confronted Paul about these texts, he said that they were just playing around. But to even do that is so disrespectful towards me. Well, instead of words of love, Julie says her husband, Paul of five years, calls her a moron, stupid, idiot, and useless. Now, even the police 
have been called to break up their altercations. Paul's a very, very strong man, and if he wanted to hurt me, he could. I'm so sick of you! Go the f away from me! One time, Paul got so violent with me, I had to call the police. Just go kill yourself! Paul and I got in a very heated fight. I didn't do anything. I didn't touch it. I threw a little small dish on the floor. I started getting really, really upset and uptight, so I went to leave the room. That's when he pushed me up against the wall with my neck. And I felt myself going higher and higher. You were pretty upset, and you were right in my face. And I, I may have, maybe I did push you a little hard, but you were right in my face. He grabbed me by the neck and lifted me up off the ground. I was so scared that when he finally let me go, I called the police. When the police came, Paul acted very cool, calm, and collected. When I was telling my story, they didn't believe me. I was getting more upset. They showed up. You got lippy with him. He told you to sit down and be quiet and be calm. You start snatching your hands back from him, and he put the cuffs on you. They they said I was acting crazy and belligerent, so I was arrested. But Paul tried to strangle me and could have killed me. Why did you get belligerent with the police? Because they didn't believe me that he was strangling me. Well, Julie has complaints about Paul. She says, he says, I'm sorry too many times that it loses its meaning. Mm -hmm. Treats dogs better than he treats Julie. Hit with a shoe kicked out of the house, grabbed arms and shook her, picked up by the neck, called useless, moron, loser, threw glass of water at her, threw mail at her, has sex six times a year, won't fix the house. Mm. When did you hit her with a shoe? I don't remember. I, I, did you hit her with a shoe? I think I slapped her on the butt with a shoe, if that's what we're talking about. You took your damn flip-flop out on me and slapped me around in it, and then you packed my bags and put me out, and I had to walk to the freaking hotel sleeping in the hotel that night. This is before you got married? Yes, sir. He said he was sorry, and then he would never do it again. Right. And everything was great for several years, and... W when did it go bad? What, what changed? Well, some pretty big issues, like the, the deal with my son, and uh, the, you know, the... The whole not working thing. I mean, I've had the same job for over 12 years, and it's not very... So you resent not, her being unstable job-wise? Sure, it affects me. It's not a, really a money thing as much as it is security, and, hey, we're not doing the right thing here, you uh -huh. know? Right. Did it bother you that he was sexting with a couple of friends? What do you think? I mean, yeah, absolutely. Well, it I ask you where it ran off the rails. He didn't mention that. I wonder if you just forgot that. Um, well, did that contribute was, to is, the drama? Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. This was over two years, two years, three, almost three years ago. So it was about the same time things started unraveling. Mm -hmm. You embarrassed yourself doing it. Not only me and family, you embarrassed me, yourself. Why would you, why would you want to do that and not want to uh, well, have it's... words like that and fun like that with your wife. Let me give you an example. Uh, this, all this is out of context. For example, that was not even the machete in question. I didn't even have that one at the time. And she overdrafted yesterday. Well, he said it was out of context. It, it, it taken <laughs> wrong. What did it say? I have a beeper. Do I'll, Phil, I'll bleep it out. Dr. Phil, we're talking about <laughs> sex, stuff like that. You know, this was, this was not that's, appropriate. That it wasn't seems, appropriate. That seems kind of unambiguous. He got you. <laughs> no, I'm just saying that seems kind of unambiguous unless she's a glass blower or something. I don't know. What, <laughs> um, well, it's, it's joking that went out of hand and that was my fault. But you did break the remote. I, I don't know what he's talking about as far as a remote. I'm sorry, that's a first. I can break one right now for you if you want, but... Yeah, no, no. Really... <laughs> All right, coming up, Julie says they have sex maybe an average of six times a year. She says that's part of their problem. We'll talk about that when we come back. You had to go on TV to do that? Yep. Okay. He didn't want to be embarrassed, and I know he's embarrassed, but... About what? I, I'm here to be honest. You said some things that he's going to be mad at you for? Yeah.
son from another marriage. He's 15. But when he comes to visit, Julie makes me feel like I have to ride him and make him do chores. When Paul's son comes to visit, he lets him get away with everything. He is a very spoiled child. She antagonizes me to tell him what to do. I have to be the middleman. It's time for you to stand up as a father. He needs a little discipline. I wish I could just spend quality time with my son and not have Julie, you know, nagging. So, do you resent her? Probably is now. Why? Because. Have you said some things that he's going to be mad at you for? Yeah. What? <laughs> he didn't want to be embarrassed, and I know he's embarrassed, but. About what? I, I'm here to be honest, and I want some doggone help. We need help. I want our love life to be fixed. I want you to mo get motivated more around the house. You had to go on TV to do that? Yep. Okay. Well, we're here. It matters to me, so. It was not my choice. Well, well I've been listening. Choice. I've been listening to you yell and scream at her in a highly abusive way. So yeah, I think you did have to come on TV to do that because I think you're a loudmouth bully when you're behind closed doors. Thank you. So yeah, I, I think so. I mean, let's listen to it. Let's listen to you talking to her. This is a moron. You can't even operate a car like that. You need a horse. You idiot. I work my. Oh, you and all you do is me over. I'm so sick of you. Go the away from me. Just go kill yourself, you loser. I hate your guts. You're just killing me. You don't even care. You user. You're just an evil. And I hate you. I regret the damn I'm so sick of you and your never it. And it's never your fault. <laughs> You want to be mad at her for coming on, we had to come on television to do this? Yeah, because an abuser isolates their victim. They get them behind closed doors by themselves where they can't fight back, they impose their will, they yell and scream, and that's abuse, and you are a loud mouth bully when you do that to your wife. Now tell me that's out of context. No, I can't. Go kill yourself. I hate you. That's also a boiling point, and I don't. But it's okay for you to talk to me like that. I don't care how boiling you get. No, you don't okay. treat a woman like that. You don't treat your wife like that. You either get help or you get away, because that's not okay. Well, first of all, I can say this, and I, with all honesty. I do have a loud mouth, and that's terrible, but I've never put my hands on you, ever. I never would. And for you to say that is a complete lie, and you well, know you it is. Well, you just said in the video that you shoved me, but you really were choking me. You had both, and that was the night that I felt I needed to call help. So I dialed 911. I have a different opinion on that. Right, so, like you have with your son in that incident, too. Let's yeah. assume you said, maybe I pushed you harder than I should have. Okay, that's what you said on the tape. Let's assume she's histrionic, belligerent, out of control. I mean, she did get arrested that night, so let's assume she was not totally rational that night. That's an understatement, but yeah. Do you think that's not abuse? Well, sure it is. That is mental, emotional, verbal abuse. And if you can't be around her without doing that, then you shouldn't be around her. If, if that's what happens when the two of you are together, then you should not be together unless and until you get the help necessary to create an environment in which you can communicate in a more mature fashion. And what you may think can be a little embarrassing in the moment could be saving both of you a hell of a lot of trouble going forward if this turns out to be a wake-up call for the two of you. Now, Paul says there are three major things that Julie needs to fix. He says things could change, things could turn around. I don't know, maybe it's too late for all that. We'll be right back. If I had to describe what I think I'm looking for in, in a wife or in Julie is I want her to generally be nicer. The thing is, I don't really like you because your attitude sucks. And I want a wife that listens to me and doesn't talk over me so much. You know, I need some... I, need I, I let you talk, so let me talk. 
and stop badgering me the second I hit the floor. If you don't have anything nice to say, maybe just don't say anything. Paul's ideal wife would just shut their mouth and just do what he says. Paul says he has requirements for the perfect wife. He says, one, be mute. Two, talk whether things are good or bad. Three, help her husband. Four, have goals in life. Five, be responsible. Six, have common sense. Seven, be a nice person. Eight, no me-isms. And nine, no drama. Now, in your defense, when you said be mute, you joked and said, I can't believe I said that out loud. You were being somewhat facetious. But you believe there are times she just needs to zip it. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. And you said that there were three things she needed to change. Number one, her priorities. Number two, her communication style. And three, her penchant for conflict. She just needs to stop creating constant conflict. Right. What do you say about that? Sir, um, then I wouldn't be a woman. I mean, yeah, I'm going to be drama. A girl does that. I mean, she wants some attention. I mean, if you give me some attention. But for me to just shut up, not have a voice, not to talk, not to communicate. I mean, that's how I communicate. Maybe I need to work on that. What do you, what do you want here? I want to be treated like a good wife and not be yelled at like this and not be thrown around. I want some respect. I want to be motivated more in our marriage. I want us to love each other. I want you to kiss me when I come home or when you come home. We haven't even kissed, like kiss kissed in months, eight months. The fact that you don't love me anymore, I, you should, you're here. I mean, I know you love me. But we, this can't happen anymore. I, I'm not going to live tomorrow knowing that you could do that to me again. What do you want? Can I talk now? <laughs> okay. Well, well here's, let me say a couple things. First of all, that was terrible, and that was me at my worst. And what I want is for somebody, you, to not push my buttons to the point where I can act like that and then be recorded, which, who does that for a later date? Why don't you even do that? I mean, what's the point in that? Is that, is that because you love me that's going to help us? Or you push buttons to make me act like that and then you record it? I didn't know you were doing that. I was just being myself and that was terrible. But, and that's what, five times? <laughs> five times over a period of ten years, maybe? That's five times too many. Sure it is. The I question know. was, what it's do like you... like you did that. The question was, what do you want? I want those three things. I want, I want her to uh, be accountable. I want her to work on her priorities and cre quit creating this conflict. So, for example, if I'm working all day and then I walk in the door and she fires up the argument maker and starts cooking up another batch of turmoil and I act like that, and then you turn the phone on and that's, you know, that's just another bullet in the magazine, right? What? Well, are you a slow learner? <laughs> he apparently said I she just, does it. Apparently I just refuse to quit. Well, maybe that's good. Uh, I asked you what you wanted, what you wanted. I'm going to tell you what I want when we come back. Tomorrow on an all-new Dr. Phil. She's beautiful. You're not going to clap. And out of control. We don't want you to end up in jail. Why would I end up in jail? Because you're breaking the law. That's tomorrow. Julie says she tries hard to be a good wife to Paul. She says she cooks, cleans, irons his clothes, and takes care of their four dogs, yet she says Paul treats her like a child. Paul says she is bringing instability and drama into their relationship, can't hold a job, doesn't contribute financially, is overdrawn at the bank constantly, and threatens the security of the relationship. Let, let me tell you what I see here. I will bet that if I knew you at a job somewhere or something like that, we would probably get along just fine. You're probably a pleasant person to be around. 
I bet if I knew you at work or something and we hung out or whatever, we'd probably get along just fine. I, I bet you wouldn't treat me the way you treat her and you wouldn't be antagonistic. I mean, it's, there's a chemistry here between the two of you that's situation specific. You, you don't react that way to people, other people in your life, do you? I hope not. At work or whatever, and you don't have people yelling and screaming at you. You don't provoke people or whatever. It's the way you two come together. And both of you have very legitimate wants and needs and complaints about the other one. But your way of dealing with them are so illegitimate, it overshadows the legitimate complaints. Sure. So she gets away with everything because your way of responding to it is so outrageous that everything you're complaining about pales by comparison. And, and you, look, clearly you're in a very unstable situation here. You're getting yelled at, not every day, but you're getting disrespected every day. You've lost his respect because I don't know why you're doing some of the things you're doing, but you teach people how to treat you, and somehow or another, you all have defined this in such a way that you're, you're living in a situation where neither one of you are getting what you want. You don't marry someone so you can be in an emotionally barren environment. Right. He wants a soft place to fall. He doesn't want to come home, and the minute he opens the door, whack, 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 yeah. whack, 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 which is exactly what you get, right? He doesn't want to open his eyes in the morning, and first thing he gets, whack, 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 whack. That's not what he wants. You don't want to walk in the house every day feeling like you're on eggshells where you're going to get blasted for being an idiot, moron, this, that. Both of you are apparently so frustrated about something that you're just venting towards each other something terrible. And that is a, that is not an okay place to be. We can't do this show without you, our studio audience. If you are going to be in the Los Angeles area and you would like free tickets, go to drphil.com and click on Be in the Audience. Because we have a lot of fun here, don't we? Or you can call. 323-461-PHIL. That's 323-461-7445. Maybe you two should get a divorce. Maybe you shouldn't. But what you should do is make this agreement. We may get a divorce and we may not. But we will not stay married this way, another Damn. day in our life. That's what you should agree for certain. We should make that agreement for sure. Okay. And if that means you can't be around her, then don't be around her. If that means you can't be around him without lighting into him or what, then don't be around him at this point. What I would hope you would say is, we're not getting a divorce, and we're not staying married like this anymore either. Right. That's what I would hope you would say, because I can tell you, you're not ready to get a divorce yet, because you haven't done the work. You haven't earned the right to quit this yet. The time to get a divorce is when you can look at each other and yourself in the mirror and say, okay, there is no stone left unturned. I can honestly look myself in the mirror and say, I've done everything I know how to do. I have no unfinished emotional business. I'm not angry. I'm not bitter. I, I'm not hurt. I, I've, I've done everything. I am at peace with the decision that it's time to end this relationship. And you can't say that now, and you can't say it now, because all you've done is suffer and vent. You, you haven't done any of the work. Give me 90 days. Give me 90 days to bring you some serious help 
for this relationship and really have you do some problem solving and some issue resolution. And if at the end of that time you say, I'm, I'm at peace with it, then you can, get, you can get divorced for the rest of your life. You can be divorced for a long, long time. Give me 90 days to try to solve this situation with some professional help before you pull that trigger. Are you willing to do that? Absolutely. Learned a lot today. Okay. Thanks to Paul and Julie coming up. Do you ever feel judged because of your age? Next, a hidden camera experiment where no one over 40 is allowed to eat. Wait till you see this. We'll be right back. Today, we're not serving anybody over 40. Really? Could you just have your mom step away from the food truck? That's the definition of ages. Older people just don't really fit into our culture. That's ridiculous. We actually don't think that this truck is a good fit for you. Ready to get real? Go to DrPhil.com for advice on relationships, parenting, finances, and more. Plus, weigh in on your favorite episodes, share your stories, and find support in the Dr. Phil community. When you sign up for the community, you will automatically be subscribed to the Dr. Phil Show newsletter. Log on to DrPhil.com today. Okay, can you imagine trying to place your order at a food truck and being told that no one, and I mean no one over the age of 40, is allowed to eat there. <laughs> that anyone old needs to step back from the establishment because you are ruining their image. <laughs> Sounds unbelievable, right? Well, you'd be surprised how many people judge others by the numbers, the number of wrinkles that is. Let me show you what happened during a little hidden camera experiment. Take a look. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good, how are you? Just one question really quick. Um, you're not over 40, are you? No. Perfect. Great. Oh, age limit? Every day, age discrimination happens in the workplace behind closed doors. And we wanted to see what it would look like out in the open. We're just trying to look for a young, hip vibe. That's fine. I'm, I'm 28. Do you want to see my Okay, hand? just as long as you're not eating no, it. No, no, no. No, she's okay, not no, eating I believe it. you. I believe Excuse you. Me. Could you just have your mom step away from the food truck? Why? Yeah, it I just gives just people the wrong impression. Okay. You are exactly what we're looking for in our company. I was shocked. We shouldn't be discriminating anyone for any reason. Why nobody? My mom left her job to take care of my grandmother, and so when she went back into the workforce to look for another job, a lot of people would not hire her due to her age. We're actually not serving anyone over 40 today. Hey, okay, for real. Older people just don't really fit into our culture. That's ridiculous. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Joining me to discuss this very important topic is Joanne Jenkins, the CEO of AARP and the author of a new book, Disrupt Aging. So welcome. Thank I'm you. so glad Thank that you. you're here. Thank you. <laughs> now, you guys put this experiment together, and boy, did you tick some people off. Uh, what were you trying to prove? I think the most important thing is that ageism is alive and well, uh, and it's ageless. It's not just about people who are over the age of 40, but it also affects the young as well, whether it's a young student coming out of college trying to find that first job or somebody over the age of 50 who, who might be transitioning to a new career. Right. And ageism exists. Right. And I think the important part, if you saw this and it happened to you at the food truck, then why do you allow it to happen to you every day? at the workplace or in your personal lives. Yeah, it's just right there, a big spotlight was put on it, but it happens invisibly Every in day. so many other places. Now, Alana and Candace were part of this video, right? Yes. The, the food truck server asked your mom to move away from the truck, right? Yeah. <laughs> so how did it make you feel? Well, I was really shocked and surprised. Like, I, I just couldn't really believe what was going on. And I was like, this can't, this can't be real. Candace, this just makes you mad, right? Yes. Yes, it does. I saw that they weren't serving anybody over the age of 40, and I did get mad. And I believe discrimination is wrong as anyway. So, Joanne, how do stereotypes about aging 
really hurt society. You guys deal with this every day. Well, we do, and I think the biggest area is it puts up these artificial barriers. So people begin to believe these stereotypes uh, and outdated beliefs themselves, and it actually prevents people from living their best life and doing what it is they want to do regardless of their age. You know, in your book, Disrupt Aging, it said that people that are 30 or under think 60 is defines old. Yes, they do. Oh. That's scary, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> you didn't have to put that in there, did you? Uh, it is scary. And that did used to sound old. It doesn't sound old anymore. No, it doesn't. Because people think I might be 60 since I'm, I have thinning hair. Uh, they, they might think that. But here's the thing. You bring up some really important stuff for us to think about, and not just to think about as we get to some of these numbers, but to start thinking about early on. We're living longer. You talked about a life expectancy growing so much more now than it ever has before. Share that. We're going to live another 20 or 30 years. The fastest growing age segment in this country is people over the age of 85, and the second is over the age of 100. And if you think about, we're, we're creating a whole new middle age, extended middle age, so that you're going to live more time in your adulthood than you lived as in your childhood. Wow. Okay. So... But the financial structure is not geared for that. No, it's not. So we got to come up with the money. Absolutely. I like to focus it in the book around uh, three areas, around health, wealth, and self, that we need to take control and own our age and take control of our health. Uh, we need to be empowered users of the healthcare system, not dependent patients. We need to start saving sooner. We can't just depend on Social Security, but we have to start saving so that we don't outlive our wealth. Uh, and then this last area of self, how do we, in this extra 20 or 30 years that we're going to live, start doing and becoming the person that we've always wanted to be? How do we find our uh, passion? How do we reimagine who we are at 50 plus? Yeah, it seems to me that I, I see a lot of these companies with these mandatory retirements and all. Why are we kicking out the people with all the experience? That doesn't make any sense to me. Let's get rid of the people with the experience and bring in somebody that doesn't know squat. Now, we actually have some people in the audience um, that say they were discriminated against on the job because of their age. Cheryl, tell me what happened to you. Yes, I'm an accountant with over 40 years experience. So the owner two years ago said to me, we're letting you go. You can go retire now. And I just didn't think that was really right. Do you think it was totally because of your age? Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's happening more than it should. Uh, and that's why I said about sending experience home. And this is something we just need to address. Absolutely. And if you think about the work shortages that we have in this country, this 50-plus workforce could be a solution for the country. Oh, my gosh. Now, it's Marquetta, right? Exactly, yes. Uh, tell me about your situation. I was stalking shells, and they were constantly on me about pick up the pace, pick up the pace, you're moving too slow. You need to, to um, work like this 20-year-old. And they even started calling me grandma. I, it was blatant age discrimination. Yeah, that's not good. Uh, so age discrimination is not only in the workplace. It's really all over the place. And your book is about solutions to that. But a lot of it comes with the way you see yourself and your own vision of your self-image, your self-esteem, and how you position yourself in your life and your world, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It is about owning your age and uh, not in a hateful way, but confronting this whole issue of ageism uh, and calling it out when we see it like we did in the food truck video. It, it really is about all of us taking responsibility for not defining people based on their age. Yeah. And that's why you say health, wealth, wealth and, and self. self. That's, that's what you got to focus on. 10,000 people are turning 65 every day, and that's going to happen for the next 14 years. And so if you think about how we live today, we need to adapt uh, and get rid of these outdated stereotypes uh, 
and come up with new solutions so that we can continue to age better. All right. Well, look, this book is a must read no matter what your age. It's going to help change the conversation about aging. And we really need to do that. And everyone in the audience is going to get a chance to learn how they can change their views. So you're all getting a copy of Joanne's book, Disrupt Aging. If you want more information on how to disrupt aging, go to their website, disruptaging.aarp. We all learned something today, and I hope we can make a change. And really think about that. Ask yourself if you're one of those people that discriminates based on age. And if you catch yourself doing it, cut it out. Uh, I want to thank all of my guests today, especially Joanne Jenkins. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much. I'll see you backstage. Thanks, guys. new Dr. Phil. She's obsessed with gambling. I've lost between three and four hundred thousand. Out of control. You're gambling away your rent money. I can't stop. Out of cash. How many credit cards have you opened? Between fifty and hundred. And she has a big favor to ask of Dr. Phil. Why did you bring me these bills? I thought maybe he might pay them. You wanted me to pay them. You don't have to pay them if you can't afford it. Let's do it. Is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. I'll try to be an emotional compass and point you in the right direction. Five, four. I am not giving up on you. $100,000. Would you play the lottery or go to the casinos if you believed you had a good chance of winning all that money? Yes. If you won, what would you do? Maybe buy a home like this one that was recently on the market for 400,000 bucks? Yeah. Or how about buying a brand new sports car like this? Yeah. Or how about sending up to four children to a four-year college? Yeah. I'm sure we can all find endless ways to spend the cash. Yeah. So what if I told you that our guest Debbie Flush $400,000 right down the drain just on regular slot machines at the casinos. Oh, Debbie is a self-admitted gambler for the last two decades who loves to play the slots so much that she says she turns demonic. I have been gambling for over 20 years. My mom's addiction has taken over her life. I drop hundreds of dollars. It's just paper. I am completely addicted to every slot machine. I walk through a casino door and I'm not myself anymore. I become obsessed, like a demonic feeling. The only thing that matters to my mom when she's at the casino is putting her money in the machine. Gambling has turned my mom into a monster. When I go on a gambling binge, I could stay there for days, and I have. I've done everything possible to feed my addiction. I've opened between 50 and 75 credit cards to feed my addiction. If I had to put a dollar amount on how much I've lost over the years, between three and four hundred thousand dollars at one point it controlled all of her money i couldn't control her she would make a scene in public screaming at me for her credit card i would get explosive when i couldn't have a hundred here a hundred there on one occasion the police were called due to my explosive
behavior. My mom has told me that she'd stop gambling, and then there's been times where I've gone to the casino and found her there. When I leave a casino and I'm broke, I cry. I hate myself. I scream in the car. I hate you. What is wrong with you? You have a family. You have to feed your children. Then I turn around and I go back. I am addicted to gambling, and it has taken over my life. Okay, so you know this, right? Yeah. You know it about yourself. This isn't something that you are kind of think you can handle or you think you have under control. I have no control over it. I can't handle. So you've heard the term degenerate gamblers, and that describes someone in lay terms that will blow it all. They'll blow their rent money. They'll blow their savings. They'll run up their credit card. They'll do it all. And that's you. Yes. You've been trying to stop her. Yeah. She yells at me and says she doesn't need help. Why do you do that if you tell me now you know better? To be honest with you, um, I don't want to hurt my children, but I can't stop, so I... I've become a compulsive liar as well on top of it, lie after lie after lie. Uh, you've actually gone in the casino. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've walked up to her in the casino mm -hmm. and said, come on, what are you doing here? Yeah. You've actually taken her money in the casino. Yeah, I've brought her out of the casino. We've been in the parking lot yelling at each other. And she'll stay and you leave. Yeah. I mean, even though she knows you're upset, she'll say, you'll leave, I'm staying. Yeah. All night. She'll be gone all night. You said when you walk through that casino door, you become a whole other person. You said, I become demonic. I become like a devil person. When I walk through a door, a casino door, my mind is focused on a slot machine. I'm not Debbie in there. I don't know how to explain it. I, I can't control myself. I can't, if I have my bank card with, which I try to leave at home, I'll drain it even though I have a $300 limit on it daily. They have a machine in the casino that overrides it. So you can drain your account. How many credit cards have you opened? At least between 50 and 100. It has to be. It has to be. 50 and 100 credit cards. At least. Yeah. You just keep opening and opening and opening so you can get more money. Yeah, because I can't afford to gamble on my, <laughs> you know what I mean? Ah, I should have never said that one. <laughs> oh, boy. No, you got, come on, be honest. You have barred yourself from casinos. You've gone and told them, here's my picture. You spread this around. Do not let my happy ass in here ever again, right? You have Correct. Put, you many told times, them to keep you many out. Many times, many times, many times. They let you in? Yeah. You tell them it's not you on a picture? Yeah, I have done that. Well, what do you do to get money? What do I do to get money? Yeah. Where's this money coming from? <clears throat> you said I can't I win, afford. I win, I win. And then I lose. I, I've won quite a few jackpots. You've won 60000 in a year. Correct. You said you spread all those hundreds out and you were hooked. Big time. How long did it last? How long did money last? About half a year, maybe, if that. Before you lost it back? Oh, yeah. I don't want to do it. I do it. I'm not me in that casino, okay? I'm not. When I walk through the door, I'm, I'm not me. It, it takes over my mind. My, I can't stop. I just, so why do you walk through the door? I can use ex excuses to you like, okay, I lost a bunch of money. I have to go back and get it back. I use that a lot. But I don't seem to be able to walk out with it again. So why do I do it? I don't know. One would think that you would say, you know, there's a pattern here. They keep taking my money and running me off till I come back with some more. 
you would think this is stacked against me. I, I can't win. I've lost $400,000. So I'm asking, are you a slow learner? No, I'm pretty good with math, but you know, hey, you know, I, I'm not trying to laugh and joke. I'm serious. I have self-medicated myself over the years with alcohol prescription pills so I don't have to face reality, okay? You I'm said the only time you've ever left with money is when she came in and drug you out before you could lose it. You said you left once with $3,000. Towards the end of my, towards the end here, yeah. I mean, I did walk out. Yeah, tag you, drag you out before you could lose eight it. Eight years ago, I walked out with ten, twelve thousand. 12000 and paid some bills off, but then put it all back in. Well, Debbie says she has a big favor, and I mean a big favor to ask me. We'll talk more about that next. She brought some bills with her. Why, why did you bring me these bills? Thought maybe he might pay them. You don't have to pay them if you can't afford it, you know? I don't know. And later, what's lurking in Debbie's past that continues haunting her to this day? I, I can't even imagine the, the pain that you, you had to feel. All these years, I've been hiding it, I guess. Tomorrow, on an all-new Dr. Phil, their daughter was a soldier. You got blown off a 40-foot wall. Yeah, she was a tough Marine. She's not tough anymore. Now, being injured in Iraq led to my drug use. She's a heroin addict. You took her to a drug deal. She's getting poison and you're driving her to pick it up. She needs me. She hates me. She loves me. She yeah, doesn't fine. want me. Tell me what you think and feel. Don't tell me what she thinks and feels. That's tomorrow. When it comes to my family, I feel like I've run out of chances. I hate myself. When I look in the mirror, I see all the hurt I've done to my family. There was a time that I lied to a family member and borrowed $20,000 to pay off credit cards. I was unable to pay her back. Now, I don't think she wants anything to do with me anymore. My gambling has ruined my relationship with my daughter. My greatest fear is that my mom will be homeless. If she becomes homeless, my fear is she'll not be able to keep my brother with her. I tell myself I won't be homeless. The pain won't go away. The withdrawals won't go away. The pain of what I've done to my family. But I still want to go back to try to win money, to pay my bills. There's no out. I don't have anything to numb myself with right now. And it's really hard, you guys. When Debbie arrived in Los Angeles and met up with our staff, she brought some bills with her that she asked to be delivered to me. They, they did. They delivered these to me. There's vehicle title and licensing, renter's insurance bill that uh, isn't open. I guess she wanted me to open this one here. Why, why did you bring me these bills? Do you want me to answer that? <laughs> I actually thought that if I was going to maybe get some kind of counseling or help, that these were the bills my daughter needed to take home with her, and then I thought, well, maybe he might pay them. <laughs> so it wasn't my first choice to bring them to you. My daughter was going to take them home and make sure they got paid somehow. I'm I paying them. What? I'm not paying them. Well, that's not what you said. You said you wanted me to pay them. Well, someone. <laughs> I don't know what to do anymore. You don't have to pay them if you can't afford it, you know? I don't know. I, I know I'm bailing out again. I'm sorry. 
I can't, I can't pay them either, so I, I don't I can know. afford it, and I still don't have to pay them. Yeah, right. Um, I'm trying to get a window to your thing. How long have we known each other? A minute or two? Yeah. It would be about 20 minutes. And then, yeah, and I'm sorry, I shouldn't have even asked. <laughs> I, I can't stop. I, 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 I don't, don't want to lose my third child. But, but yet you're gambling away your rent money. Yeah. I don't mean to. It controls me in that casino. I can't stop. How long have you been living where you're living? Oh, about a month and a half. Yeah. How long were you living where you were living before that? A year. Uh huh. And why'd you leave there? She was making a scene and trying to bang on my door and get money from me. For? to go gamble and the whole neighborhood saw and the cops came well you weren't in the casino then you I said have... you come you become a different person when you walk in the casino that's your trigger that environment Correct. changes you into the devil person but you weren't in a casino when you were banging on her door to the point that the cops came and you're demanding money to go gamble that's incorrect. What is correct? I had been at a casino for five, six hours and lost. I came to where I was living and I had asked for more money. To get even? Yeah, my own money that I had my daughter hold on to so I could have Christmas with my son and my daughter she was holding on to $2,000 of my money. To not give her. You, you came to get Christmas money to go back to Correct. the casino because you say you get vengeance money. You say you come home, you're vengeance. I'm going to get some money to go back and kick their ass, right? Mm -hmm. So she stands in the gap, says, I'm not giving you this money. I'm not mm -hmm. giving you the money. And you demand it's your money. You want it. By God, give me my money. Mm -hmm. The point is you're standing there demanding money to go gamble with. <laughs> Debbie claims she didn't even start gambling until she was in her 30s. Uh, what happened in her life to transform her from being a typical wife and mother with a job to what she self-describes as a crazed demon? Uh, we'll be right back. Twenty years ago, I lost my son. My brother died on my birthday. I blame myself for his death. I thought I killed him. And later, his parents called him a moocher. Is Ryan back on his feet or on the streets? You went to Texas. You got yeah. a job. Yeah. But you got fired after a week? <laughs> no, it was after a day. Debbie claims she can't control the pull of the casinos and the urge she has to hit those slot machines over and over again. And yet, she didn't always have this uncontrollable addiction. Her daughter Serena believes this all started when her mother tragically lost her son to leukemia at just two years old. And instead of facing the pain, Debbie looked for other ways to just switch off. 20 years ago, my son, RJ, was diagnosed with a high-risk leukemia. RJ was 13 months old. My son, RJ, had a bone marrow transplant. My daughter gave bone marrow, which nearly killed him. I could not put my son through another bone marrow transplant. It was too painful. I lost my son to cancer. She uses my brother's death as an excuse for her to gamble. I gamble not to feel pain. My brother died on my birthday, and I never look forward to my birthday because I know she's going to go out and gamble. It makes me feel hurt. My brother's been gone for 20 years, and she's never dealt with the loss. I thought I killed him. 
by not doing another transplant. I blame myself for his death. I just wish she would be at peace with him being in heaven. Well, I, I, I can't even imagine uh, the, the, the pain that you, you had to feel at that Thank time. You. you had a very difficult decision to make, right? Whether to do the second bone marrow transplant or not. And you made the decision to not do it. And you've questioned that ever since? Just recently, um, my ex-husband had said, you're destroying your daughter like you destroyed your son. Right there, I thought, oh my gosh. I have been hiding this for, or not even realizing this for so many years that maybe I did all these years. I've been hiding it, I guess, because I didn't realize until the ex-husband saying to me, you're trying to destroy <clears throat> your daughter like you destroyed your son. It just popped out. God, I, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm just not sure I can uh, go along with his blurted out analysis and diagnosis there i'm sorry had i been sitting with you in that room at the time that you were making that decision um, i can't tell you that i would have advised you differently than what you said what you the decision you made uh there's very moral basis for making the decision that you made i mean what do you put the, the child through What's the risk reward ratio? Uh, th that's a that's a very difficult decision that parents have to sometimes make in dealing with a terminal illness and what you want the quality of life to be at that point. And that's a decision that only you could make at that time, and you made it. And I certainly couldn't fault that decision. They show pretty people having fun. They don't show you standing at the door screaming at your daughter for more money. They don't ever show that on a commercial, do they? And later, you said the help that I offered and arranged for you just sucked. The life push that was assigned to me totally failed me. If you have a family member or a friend who you believe is living a lie, and needs help coming clean with themselves, with you, with whoever. Log on to drphil.com and share your story. I do know that things often start for one reason and continue for a very different reason. Maybe you started self-medicating, as you said, but then pretty soon this took on a life of its own. They show pretty people having fun in casino commercials. They don't show you standing at the door screaming at your daughter for more money. They don't ever show that on a commercial, do they? Yeah. They don't ever show you with a file full of bills trying to figure out how you're going to pay them. They don't show that in a commercial, do they? Yeah. Because right now, if you stopped gambling, would your life be peaches and cream? Of course it wouldn't. You have a lot of other challenges in your life. And if right now your coping mechanism, your escape mechanism, your eject button from the pain is to lose yourself in a casino and that's taken away from you and nothing is put in its place, you know what's going to happen? You're going to default right back to what you were doing. You know, I'd like to add Dr. Frank Lawless to the conversation. He's the chairman of the Dr. Phil Show Advisory Board. Uh, Frank, welcome. Glad to have you here. Thank you. Frank is director of the uh, Lawless PVP and P Center. 
Uh, he has also written the book Psychoneuroplasticity, Protocols for Addiction. Frank, what needs to happen here? Well, first of all, we need to recognize that it is the, the problems are neurological, which means that they are deep below your consciousness, so you are really out of control. There needs to be a broad program that encompass uh, not only your lifestyle, but also your neurological functioning and your psychological coping skills. And there's a comorbidity here. Your addiction to gambling is existing in parallel with some other things. And depression, for example. Anxiety, for example. Those things have to be dealt with in parallel to what we're talking about here. You, you got to deal with everything. At one time you fix one thing and not the other, then you, that's a half a loaf. You, you've got to deal with everything. So what I want to do is really attack this on all fronts and give you a chance to turn this around and do it right one time. Let's get this right one time and give you your life back. And I really think in a, in a relatively short period of time, your life can look a good deal different to you. I think you can be looking back going, oh my God, I cannot believe that was me. And this is gonna begin with, I, I, what I would like to do is fly you to the PMP Center to spend some time with Dr. Lawless' team. They have a team there, multifaceted team to start with a very thorough evaluation, to see everything that's going on with you, psychologically, neurologically, physiologically, hormonally, everything, and then put together a true coping plan to get this turned around. But you've got to be willing to submit yourself to it. Totally, yes. Deal? Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. All right, we'll get that set up. You can talk to her after we finish. Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm going to let these guys go. You're going to remember my guest, Ryan, was once making millions, but then moved in with his girlfriend to his parents' garage. Well, they're back with an unbelievable update right after the break. My 37-year-old son does live in my garage. There's a reason why I'm in your garage. If you don't deserve to have a family that's as supportive as they are, that loves you the way they do. After being on the Dr. Phil show, I was disappointed because I felt like Dr. Phil had missed the mark. Tomorrow on an all-new Dr. Phil. She was a tough Marine. She's not tough anymore. Now, she's a heroin addict. You took her to a drug deal. She's getting poisoned and you're driving her to pick it up. That's tomorrow. I remember my next guest, Ryan, who was living with his girlfriend in his parents' garage and claiming he just couldn't get a job, even though he was once quite successful making millions in the real estate business. His appearance on our show eight months ago, well, it was memorable. My 37-year-old son does live in my garage. This is my casa. Yeah, this is where I stay. This is the garage. Life with Ryan is extremely chaotic. I've probably asked Ryan to move out a hundred times. You're not working. No, I'm, I'm not. Why? Well, I'm on unemployment. Are you working? I'm working still. I'll be 73 next month. So he's twice your age, and he's working, but you're sleeping until 2 in the afternoon in the garage. What is wrong with you people? Ryan's 24-year-old girlfriend is also living in the parents' garage. Mine and Ryan's usual day is we wake up and we just kind of, we, we kind of let the day come to us. I feel like I can't help but be mean to Rachel. She aggravates me. You know what? You are stuck. You got a chip on your shoulder. I strongly suspect it's frustration. You're taking it out on everybody else. Listen, I'm a 37-year-old adult that deserves that respect, and there's a reason why I'm in your garage. You don't deserve to have a family that's as supportive as they are, that loves you the way they do, the way you treat them like 
I don't want to kick Ryan out on the street because in the back of my mind, I would feel terrible if he were really sick. Do you think he's mentally ill? I think he's bipolar. Where did you go to medical school? <laughs> I've never treated a bipolar patient where I called the adult patient's mother up and said, OK, here's what I want you to do. Have no accountability. Allow him to be mentally and emotionally abusive. Let him sleep until the middle of the afternoon and don't let him get a job. That's what I need you to do to help me get him back as a meaningful contributing member of society. Don't you want to be proud of you again? Well, sure. I know how to get you back in the game and I am willing to bring you the resources to do that. Well, I told Ryan's parents that the only way they would see their son make it is if they kicked him out of the garage. They did listen. Take a look. Since we were on the Dr. Phil show, we finally had to evict Ryan to get out of our garage. This is my garage. I own everything in here. It's not anything of Ryan's. We've been living at the motels, getting money from resources. Hey, what's up, Dan? Since being on the show, I have spent $3,000 on Ryan. There's been 10, 12 times that I've put him in a hotel. We're living day by day. A lot of times, we definitely have to reach out for a lifeline to help us. Um, I was wondering if you can give me a ride down to... No? Okay, thanks for your help. Ryan is currently not working. He hasn't held a job for three, four years. We tried to maintain our normality by going to the gym, exercising, and we have a, his racquetball. Good. After being on the Dr. Phil show, I was disappointed because I felt like Dr. Phil had missed the mark. He was a moocher, but the symptoms behind that, I felt, were mental illness and drug issues. I don't think I, I have a mental problem. I think we have a financial problem. Well, Ryan and his girlfriend, Rachel, are here while Ryan's parents, uh, Mike and Vicki, join us uh, via Polycom. Even though Vicki thinks I missed the mark on uh, Ryan, you did take the advice to get him out of the garage. How long did that take? About six weeks. After the show, about, about, about six weeks. Uh, had to evict him to, to accomplish that. Are you glad you did it? Are you sad that you did it? Uh, how do you feel about it? I'm positively thrilled. I mean, I, I couldn't, I felt like it was a burden off my shoulders that uh, would never go away. Yeah. Are, are you at peace with that, even though I know it's difficult? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Your, your, your mother thinks that I, she doesn't disagree that I felt like you were taking advantage of them, but she says that I missed the mark in that you are mentally ill and that you need help in that regard you disagree you don't think you're mentally ill um, I'm, I'm gonna leave that to I'm properly diagnosed or, or like checked out but you you actually after some encouragement from family decided to check into a hospital yeah the, I mean everybody was pushing that direction and, and uh, you know I'm not gonna turn away from it if that's what friends and family and loved ones are saying. Did you check in too? Yes. I mean, I've known a couples where, like, one wanted to take up scuba diving, so the other one did, but I, I've, this is the first time I've heard where one was checking into a mental institution, so the girlfriend said, yeah, I'm in. Right. Well, uh, because, the, well, yeah, no, you're right. That's a... Uh, because that, and that, that's why I checked out. That's why I checked out a day later. Is because you know what? It was all for the wrong reason, and somebody else deserved to be there a lot more than either one of us. Well, did you get in conflict with the staff when you were there? Um, no, I wouldn't say that. No. Well, I thought you wound up strapped down <laughs> to a wheelchair. No, not strapped. I was asked to sit in the wheelchair and um, yeah, basically moved to a different level. I thought you told us that you talked to her in the hallway mm -hmm. and they said you weren't supposed to do that. Pass them the note, yeah. And so they, you got upset, they called security, you wound up getting strapped to a wheelchair, moved to level one, they took you up to that ward and you decided, well, 
these are some seriously uh, disturbed folks up here, and there are people that deserve to have this kind of care more than I do. I should not be taking up a bed here, so I'm going to check myself mm -hmm. out. Yeah. That's what you told us. We, we right. recorded no, 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 you're, that. You're right. That's accurate. All right. Ryan says he's trying to change his behavior, but is he really? I don't know. We'll talk more about that when we come back. You got yeah. a job. Yeah. But you got fired after a week? As an employee, I worked one day. And got fired? Yeah. Yeah. Because you took a day off. Do you need Dr. Phil's help? Text Phil to 88500 and share your story for a chance to appear on the show. Standard message and data rates may apply. We can't do this show without you, our studio audience. If you are going to be in the Los Angeles area and you would like free tickets, go to drphil.com and click on Be in the Audience. Or you can call 323-461-PHIL. That's 323-461-7445. I just cannot stand Rachel. She feeds Ryan's addiction for drugs. She's brain dead. I don't feel like I'm homeless. But I feel like I'm stuck in, in between a rock and a rock place. And so I just need help, like, getting pushed out. The only way that Ryan can recover is to eliminate Rachel totally. They're pretty harsh about you, Rachel. They say you are enabling him, that you are a drug pipeline, that you, they're saying you need to be gone out of his life and that you're bad news bears. How do you feel about that? Well, I don't know. So first they're the enabler and now I am? Like they just want to throw it on me because they're out of the way now or what? Are you all into drugs? Are you doing drugs? A little bit. What, what are you doing? Uh, smoke, smoke marijuana. Yeah. What else? Uh, that's, that's it. You went to Texas. Mm -hmm. You got yeah. a job. Yeah. Went to Texas, but you got fired after a week? Um, you know, I was after a day and doing everything that I thought was good. Passed the drug test, passed all the paperwork, got everything done. Well, why'd you get fired after one day? You said it was a schedule problem? You took a day off? No, I was, when I went in, I, I went in and I worked basically as long as they, they needed me there to get done what we needed to get done, open to close, pretty much. And when he left, um, I wasn't assigned a team, so I was on the B schedule. And that was finishing up at Bell to Bell. And it was Bell to Bell three days in a row, um, almost 12 hours. And um, I got all my stuff done. One of the managers assigned me to the A schedule, conveniently the A schedule, had uh, the next day. I don't, so you worked I, one day? No, I worked three days. But my paperwork went through for the drug test in the background on like the second day. Worked you were there one, three days. As an employee, worked. I worked one day. And got fired? Yeah, yeah. Because you took a day off? Because I took a day off. And so then you had to walk back? Uh, yeah, well, but once that had happened, I had the car, the, the car rental car that we drove out there and since he had stopped the process and everything, that went upside down, $400. I gave the car back. And you, you said the help that I offered and arranged for you just sucked. You said just nothing to that. I'm, I'm going to speak, I'll speak honest with you on this. The, the, the life coach that was assigned to me totally failed me, yes. Yeah. I feel personally that's, that's what happened. <laughs> we both played phone tag, me leaving messages, him calling me back. And, and, and leave messages for me. And, um... Yeah, we keep very detailed records about that. Um, mm -hmm. On February 2nd, we got a message from you mm -hmm. uh, to Anthony Haskins, our resource director, on the 3rd. Call back. A girl answers. I asked for Ryan. She tells me he's not there. I leave a message for him, with her, for him to call me back. I hear Ryan talking to her, telling her what to say in the background. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're there. He can hear you in the background telling her to say you're not there and what to tell. Well, to if, say. well if he called at a time that I was working on something else that, that, that was helping me make money, that would be the only reason why that would happen. You know, and I actually do but recall he hears that. you in the background telling her to say you're not there. Well, yeah, but I'm also on the computer and, and on my headset working with somebody on their site, you know, and I'm trying to get her to handle the so phone. So February call 5th, he gets another call from you on a voicemail. Mm -hmm. Then on the 6th, 
He calls back. You answer the phone at 11.30 a.m., very groggy, say you're sleeping, call back later. So that's not accurate. That, that, what you just read to me, that one thing right there is not accurate. It is accurate. Everybody in America right now is screaming at their TV screen saying, look, this arrogant guy won't take the call when you call the house, and you got an excuse and an explanation for everything. Want to know what's coming up on Dr. Phil? Visit our website and subscribe to our email newsletter. You'll get weekly updates, life strategies, and exclusive video that you won't find anywhere else. Plus, on drphil.com, you can see sneak previews of upcoming shows. Log on today. Uh, this is Anthony Haskins right here. Anthony, these are your... Mm -hmm. Contemporaneous notes at the time. You know Ryan? Yeah. Hey, Ryan. How are you? Good to see you again. Good to see you. These are your contemporaneous notes at the time, correct? Yeah, they are. And you called at 11.30 a.m.? 11.30 a.m. And he was groggy, says, call me back later. That's what happened. Then on the 10th, you have a message from Ryan, your work voicemail. He's asking for a letter from me for the court or his lawyer. It was unclear. Not sure what, but he wanted a letter from you. So you call back, a girl answers, you ask for Ryan, she asks about the letter, you say, I don't do that unless Ryan is doing what he needs to be doing and has at least started working on a program. She says, hold on, an argument ensues between the girl and Ryan about whether or not he wants to talk, and eventually she tells me he's not available and takes a message. I forgot the feeling with Ryan that he was not intending on wanting any of the help that you were offering. And I felt it was either his parents or it was this letter for the courts or some other motivation because we take very seriously the help that we provide. And we've tallied up to this point over $25 million in resources that we've provided for our guests. And when a guest reaches out and wants the help that you've offered, I take that very seriously, and I'm getting told by uh, a girl on the phone that you're not available, and I hear you talking in the background, telling her what to say. And then uh, on the other phone call, I hear an argument about this letter and just tell him I'm not available. And so I, I move on to the next person that is ready, willing, and, and committing to the help that's being offered. Everybody in America right now is screaming at their TV screen. <laughs> saying, look, this arrogant guy won't take the call when you call the house, and you got an excuse and an explanation for everything. If you want some help, you need to say so, and I will make a legitimate effort to try and help you. But I can tell you this, you make one appointment and don't show up, the exit ramp is right there, and I'm done. I won't, I won't quit on you, yeah. you know, and I do want your help. Dr. Lawless, will, will you dig in here and see what's going on? I will do an evaluation and make a, make a plan. Okay, and, amazing. And, and that's going to require, I, I, I'm going to have to fly you to Dallas to make that happen. I will do that. I want to thank all of my guests today, and a special thanks to Dr. Frank Wallace. We'll see you next time. Let's make this work, man. Seriously, let's make this work. All right, guys. on an all-new Dr. Phil. He was a major league pitcher. Richie only saw himself as a baseball player. Now his family says he's a drunk. He has insisted we not talk about alcohol, right? He said, be careful what you say on that stage. I do not think I'm an alcoholic. Do you change when you drink? I do not. I hate her. I'm done with her. My dad has told me to go myself. You're such a bitch. You've been self-medicating with alcohol because your dream got ripped from you. I'm not a drunkard. What I've been seeing today is a shell of what he is. This is that bottom of the ninth, man. You got to do this. Let's do it. Not a good show, everybody. Here we go. This 
is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. I'll try to be an emotional compass and point you in the right direction. Five, four. I am not giving up on you. dominant pitcher on some of the most storied teams in the major leagues. Lewis to the set, the 2-2 to Buter, a curve! To striking out some of the greatest players to ever wear a uniform. And a 2-2 pitch to Edmonds. Got him. He was the guy who gave it his all when the game was on the line. his first major league hit win the game in the 13th inning five to four richie lewis was a fiery competitor a three-time all-american hall of fame college pitcher setting records that still stand today he was even college roommates and close buddies with sports phenom Deion sanders he made it all the way to the majors headlining the sports pages and signing his baseball cards for fans but now Richie has new stats and a highlight reel that's not so flattering. I'm not going to sit there and listen to that and have somebody sit there and talk behind me when I'm not even in the freaking room. You're scared, bro. Okay. You're scared. Yeah. I'm not scared enough to punch you in the face. Why would you talk on. to him like that? Richie's three children say their once celebrated father is now a drunk who is embarrassing the family and slowly killing himself with whiskey, beer, and pills. I hate my drunk dad. I don't know my father as a sober, functioning person. My dad knows he has an alcohol problem, but he chooses to drink anyway. He is 100% embarrassment to the family. My dad's been drunk at so many different events. My high school graduation, his father's funeral, He's missed some of my really big games in high school, and instead he stayed home and decided to drink. Recently, he's been drinking about a water bottle full of whiskey throughout the whole day, and sometimes that's mixed with beer. Last month, I found him on his chair, unresponsive. That three minutes of me trying to wake him up were some of the scariest of my life. We thought he was dead. I'm so freaked out for him. Something has to change, or your father's not going to be around for very much longer. One time, I saw him wobble over and hit his head on the side of the fridge and fell to the floor. He just lay there with his eyes in the back of his head. When my dad gets drunk, he's been physical with me. He grabbed me by the throat and was like, don't ever size me up, and then threw me on the ground. He got right up in my face and chest bumped me. I definitely feel like I could take my dad if I needed to. One time, my dad looked me dead in the eye and said, I cannot stand you, I hate you, I am disowning you, like you. You say you hate Mackenzie? That's respectful? I think you need to start looking in the mirror. It is sad knowing that your dad is gonna kill himself slowly. I just hate the person he becomes when he drinks. In my book, it's just a drawn out suicide. Andrea says the first time she realized Richie might have a problem with alcohol, was actually the night before their wedding. I realized that alcohol was a big problem for Richie at our rehearsal dinner because he drank so much that he mooned my mother. I stayed because I was hoping that with children, he would grow out of that behavior. In the last 22 years, our family has not had positive memories with Richie. My husband has told me that alcohol is his best friend. And here's where Richie keeps his alcohol. It was Halloween, and Richie was sitting in the lawn chair on our front lawn. He had thrown up, and he was just completely passed out. One time, the neighbors and I were out in the driveway, and he was literally sideways walking down the street. We had a couple over, and Richie had his head on the table and couldn't even talk. Richie has abused everyone in our family at some point. He was hospitalized for pancreatitis, and the pancreatitis is life-threatening, and even faced with that, he still continues to drink. I have had to completely detach emotionally from him because my heart breaks every day looking at him. The kids and I are spectators of this tragic scenario.
Richie flat out denies he's an alcoholic. He says, not true, absolutely not. He says his battle is with depression, not booze. And when he found out his family wrote to the show about him, he was not happy. When he found out that I wrote into the show, he was furious. I hate her. I can't stand her. She's trying to take me down. He thinks that I have this agenda to take him down. If I didn't love my dad, I would just let him die. He was looking at this as we were ganging up on him. Rich, we love you, and that's the whole point of this whole it thing. It doesn't matter. You would have found it the wrong way. I'm not going to sit there and listen to that and have somebody and talk behind me when I'm not even in the freaking room. Richie called a family meeting and said that we were supposed to only discuss depression and not bring up alcohol at all. Go to a rehab facility. I don't need it. I think Richie is going to try to outsmart Dr. Phil. When Dr. Phil challenges my dad, I don't think he's going to be ready for it. And obviously, Dr. Phil is going to win. I want to kind of go over some things before we're joined by Richie, obviously, because he has insisted that we not talk about alcohol while you're here, right? Correct. Yes. Uh, so why did you write in? My dad has been watching your show for years. He records every single episode, but the day I actually wrote in, um, I had found him unresponsive, and um, I almost called 911. It just absolutely terrified me, like, this might be the day that I find my dad gone. So he actually sits, watches quietly, pays attention to the shows. Yes. Studies. Studies them. Mm -hmm. And why does he do that? Because I think you're counseling him every day. People at home don't know this, but I always ask people to send me a brief video when we start working with you before we do all of our interviews and everything, just so I can get a sense of everybody's personality and what the dynamics are. So we call them submission videos. So I ask each of you to give me like just a short video. And he had to review all of those before they were sent in, right? Mm -hmm. He yeah. had to screen them to make sure you didn't say anything about alcohol. Correct. Yeah. So you did that, right? Yes. And then you sent in the real set, right? Did you all do that? Yes. Yes. Here's a snippet of the real one. Our dad has been battling alcoholism and depression for years now, and it has come to a point where his health um, is just at this precipice where he's either going to live or die. I just want him healthy, and I, I don't want my dad to die soon. I want him here. All I want for him is to be able to get better. You might be one of the only people that can genuinely get through to him. Does he have a serious drinking problem, in your opinion? Yes. Any doubt? No question. He's recently been hospitalized. Yes, for mm -hmm. pancreatitis. Well, pancreatitis. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is a chronic pancreatitis, but with an acute attack, mm -hmm. and this is alcohol-induced. Yes. Okay, and they told him on discharge, zero alcohol, mm -hmm. right? right? Because if you have that condition, and then you drink on top of that, this can be fatal. He stopped for 40 days and, and just started to look a little bit healthier, a little bit clearer in his mind, and then I went up to visit her in college, and he started drinking again. He's going to come out, and we're going to talk about this. Mm -hmm. This is the time to stand strong. All right, next, from waking up in cold sweat, screaming, to feeling like he has no purpose in life, Richie is adamant the only thing he's here to discuss is his depression after leaving the game. Nothing else. Well, we're going to add him to the conversation after the break. We'll be right back. I don't know what you think is going on here. You're not going to intimidate me. I didn't want to turn this into a, you know, a fist fight up here. And later, they're worried about you. Every I do not believe you. McKenzie's worried about me in any way, shape, or form. Have and you I've grabbed her by the throat? I have never, ever grabbed her by the throat. Tomorrow on an all-new Dr. Phil. Police in Phoenix hunt for a freeway shooter. They said your gun was mashed to the bullets found in those cars. There's no way that's possible. 
10 cops jump on you, take automatic rifles and point them at you and your five-month-old daughter. I still worry because if they've manufactured evidence once to arrest me, why would they not try and do this again? They're saying we still believe he's the freeway shooter. That's tomorrow. My family can't even go out in public with my dad. My parents were out to dinner and they invited me to come stop by the restaurant. My dad got up to let me into the booth and he could barely stand. He had to use the table to hold himself up. I felt so bad for my mom because I know how painfully awkward it was for her. When he's been drinking, he's just so unpredictable. One time he picked up a full gallon of milk that was unopened and just threw it as hard as he could at my mom's head and my mom ducked and it hit the wall. He's a ticking time bomb. We're going to find him dead if this continues. Richie Lewis was a pitcher in the major leagues and adored by fans, but now his family say he's become a sloppy and belligerent drunk who may only have a year to live if he doesn't sober up. Now, before we bring him out, let's hear why he says the only opponent he's battling is depression after being forced to retire from the game he loves. Ever since I retired from baseball, it's like, who am I? I'm holding this baseball right here for the interview because it gives me security. Beating this depression is by far the hardest thing that I've ever had to do. Yeah, I'm physically alive, but my spirit inside just died. I would rather face nine Hall of Famers at the plate than to try to beat depression. Some nights I'll wake up screaming in cold sweats and the dreams are always about baseball. My dad always told me not to put all my eggs in one basket, have a safety net for when the game is over. And I said, I'll be all right. I'm going to make it, Dad. I was projected to be the number one pitcher out of college to make it to the major leagues first. I finally made it to the major leagues. I was living my dream. Here's the set and the one, two, pitch. He swings, and this is a high, hard one. I put my whole life into baseball. In the first six years of my professional career, I had four surgeries. After the first surgery, that's when the depression really started. I feel like I'm on an island out in the cold. There is no way my family understands any of this. And all they see is me miserably depressed. Well, Richie, good to meet you. I feel like I've known you for 14 years. Yeah? So you've been watching the show? I have been. All right. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I love what you're doing with your hair, too. Thank you. I got the uh, memo. <laughs> yeah. Got the memo. Yeah, birds of a feather. That's right. When you watch the show, do you learn stuff from it? Absolutely. I learn from it, and I try yeah. to take, you know, incorporate it the best I can. Yeah. You were just hospitalized, right? I was. What for? They defined it as pancreatitis. Mm-hmm. And why'd you have pancreatitis? Well, I have a bunch of reasons, I think. You know, I don't ever think it's just one thing. I think there's a myriad of things, quite frankly, with the surgeries and, and the scattered innings in between. Um, after I had my first surgery, I, I'd be scared to tell you how, how much anti-inflammatories I was taking to be able to answer the bell. Aside from that, I, I know that drinking doesn't help any. You know, that's not a, a good thing for that particular problem. Um, How much were you drinking leading up to the pancreatitis? Frequently. Physicians' instructions were no alcohol. Are you compliant with that? Well, first of all, that's not correct. I had two doctors that were assigned to me. One was a female and a male. And both of them had told me the same thing. And what they had told me was, you have to take at least a week off, but two would be better. So I just said, okay, and I just took two months off. A, a week off of what? From not drinking anything. And then I found out after prodding my wife, you know, I said, you know, because she kept telling me that's what the doctor told her, that's what the doctor told her. Well, it wasn't. It was from a nurse, not a doctor. But that's how it happened. So if we're going to be honest about it, that's how, that's how it happened. Physician, not nurse. But physician discharge orders, no alcohol, because you had acute pancreatitis. They, they said no alcohol, but they didn't yeah. say you can't drink the rest of your life. They said at least take a week and two would be better. That was the answer I got from both the attending physicians that 
directly worked with me at the hospital, and that's also the exact same answer that I got from my primary care physician. I'm just telling you straight up, if they didn't tell you, let me tell you. I'm not a physician, mm -hmm. but I've been working in this arena dealing with alcohol-related side effects for a long time. And I, I want to I talk about your depression here, but because I, I understand that that's a big issue with you, and I want to deal with that. But there's no point in dealing with that if you're going to kill yourself with drinking. This will kill you. Is that something once you get an acute case that that means you have it for the rest of your life till you pass? Yo, know, you're definitely vulnerable, absolutely. Not no vulnerable question. is not what I ask. What I ask is that that means it can't go away? No, you're, once you scar your pancreas, you're scarred. I didn't ask that either. But why would, you even, why would you even no, no, risk no, your No, 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 wait a minute. No, you think I'm playing semantics with you? No, I'm not playing semantics with you. If you're asking me, can you get out of an acute flare-up, you can get out of an acute flare-up. But once you have scarred your pancreas, mm -hmm. your pancreas is scarred. That means it cannot continue to process the alcohol that you pour on it because you have damaged it with scar tissue so it cannot process it the way it could before you did that. I'm not a drunkard. I'm a Christian man. Do I drink? Absolutely. And do I realize that some points I use that as a Band-Aid? Absolutely. Are you self-medicating your depression? On bad days, um, like I said, it's better out of 24 hours to have one hour or two hour where it at least relieves a little bit. It doesn't get rid of anything. Sure. And, and I realize that, you know, in the end, it, it actually makes it worse, not better. So I get that. But when you're at the point and you're at the level where I'm at, in my opinion, that two hours during the course of 24, especially when you're not sleeping, you know what I mean? That's, that's a big deal, man. You know, because, you know, I... I can't live 24-7, seven, seven days a week, how I'm feeling. I can't do it anymore. Well, it's my plan to fix all that. I have no intention of you living like this the rest of your life. That, that's not going to happen. On bad days, where I've had bad days and I don't do anything to relieve anything, I'm hoping that I just don't wake up. Now, I wouldn't personally do anything. That's cowardice, and I've got... You know, I just wasn't raised that way. I would never. However, that's what it feels like. Well, let's take a break. Richie's children say that um, they are scared for their dad. They say they do see the emptiness in his eyes. And it scares them when he looks them in the eye and says that he really has no reason to live. We're going to talk about the impact of those words after the break. Did he threaten you when you got here? He said, be careful what you say on that stage. It's over! It's over! And later, Dion and I have been friends for a long time. I'm broken right now, but what I've been seeing today is a shell of what he is. Richie only saw himself as a baseball player, and once the jersey was ripped off, he lost his identity. He will tell me that he does not want to live anymore. Sometimes when I'm laying in bed, I think about my future, and it really upsets me to the point of tears when I think about my dad not being here for that. I look at him and I'm like, you have such a beautiful, wonderful family. You have an absolutely stunning wife that's never given up on you and takes care of you like a freaking king, and you say you have nothing to live for. It just, it breaks my heart. Richie has gone from striking out some of the greatest baseball players of all time to breaking down in tears just watching highlights from those days gone past. He says his depression from being ripped from baseball is killing him and has had a major impact on his family. Did he threaten you when you got here? What, well, verbally. What did he say? He said, whatever, make sure you be careful what you say on that stage. I did. You, you've been watching this show for 14 years. Mm -hmm. I do my homework. Trying to get something by me is like trying to smuggle sunrise by a rooster. It's not going to happen. 
Why do you not want him to talk about alcohol? Well, because I, for one, think it's extremely hypocritical. For two, I think it's extremely judgmental, in particular, some of the things that I've been browbeat down with and about and the judgment and, and some of the name calling, et cetera. And I, I didn't want to turn this into a, you know, a fist fight up here. I wanted to, you know, there will be a fist fight up well, here. You know I'm what trying, I mean, though. I know. I'm just know I mean. Look, I'm trying to get you healthy. You, you say you don't have a degree. She doesn't have a degree. She doesn't have a degree. He doesn't have a degree. I got more degrees than a thermometer. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> well, I don't. I don't mind you embarrassing me. I made I'm that choice. I'm not here to embarrass but, you. But I'm, are you kidding listen, me? Listen, here's my point. By saying that, what I'm saying is, I don't mind being embarrassed. I don't, okay? why, why be embarrassed? I, I, there, there's, there's things that they would be embarrassed about, and I was trying to get around this without having to throw some of those out there. Are, are you all afraid of anything being said here? Is there anything you don't want said? Is there anything you're, you're concerned about? No. Is there, any, no. is there anything off limits? No. You got a green light from anybody, anything you want to talk about. You can intimidate her, 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 him, whoever. You're not going to intimidate me to the point that I'm going to let you destroy your life because you deserve better than that. I don't know what, the, what you think is going on here, but if you think that I'm going to let you come here and leave and continue to be depressed, continue to do whatever you're doing to destroy your life, you're worth more than that. I'm not going to let you do that. Do you not get that after watching me for 14 years? Once you get here, I am your worst and best nightmare. <laughs> uh, listen, it's over. It's over. Get it? Come on. It's over. It's over. It's over. You've been self-medicating yourself with alcohol. You've been sitting there because the, your dream, your passion, your reason for being got ripped from you. It wasn't fair, but it got ripped from you, and you don't know how to get out of that mourning. You don't know how to get out of that grief, so you're doing the best you know how to do. Richie's family says his denial and refusal to admit he's an alcoholic is just adding to his demise. Take a look at this. My dad will never admit that he has a problem. He said, I will always drink. No one's going to get me to stop drinking. He does not think he has a problem with alcohol. If you say alcoholic, alcoholism, it's just World War II, the Hiroshima bomb dropped in our home. He will minimize, deflect, and avoid anything when it comes to that subject. Richie blames me. He says that I've made this alcohol issue a bigger deal than it is. I haven't had a drink in 13 years. When I first stopped drinking, Richie was not happy about it. He said he lost his drinking buddy. He will 100% deny he's an alcoholic. There was one blatant lie. What? She said, um, what was it that you just when said? When I first stopped drinking. Yeah, because all I did was praise the woman. After. I praised I her. I congratulated her. First of all, she's never been my drinking buddy, barring an occasional charity event or social gathering of some sort. Never been my drinking buddy. And all I did was say, hey, good for you. If that's what you feel you need to do Not for right yourself, away. then I'm proud of you. I couldn't be more proud of her. And I said that right when she told me that's the decision she had made. Well, here's a text message that you sent to Andrea leading up to the show. Quote, I won't be made a spectacle of. Mackenzie will not take me down. So you know, I flat out told a producer today, I won't go to a rehab center so they wouldn't waste our time. Since you're posturing yourself to hide behind Dr. Phil, I can't wait to get you on that stage. So I'm guessing war until then, question mark. That's exactly what I said. And I meant every single word of it. This whole show is all about honesty, right? You want to throw it out there? Yeah. I do not think I'm an alcoholic. You're self-medicating with alcohol. Coming up. I do not believe Mackenzie's worried about me in any way, shape, or form. He blew up. He just snapped. Have you grabbed her by the throat? I have never, ever grabbed her by the throat. Are you getting along with her? Most of the time. Are you getting along with her? Usually not. Are you getting along with her? Usually all the time. Are you getting time. along with him? All the time. Okay. They're worried about you. Four people that are with you every day are worried about you. I do not believe Mackenzie's worried about me in any way, shape, or form. We asked her how she felt about you. Mm, and that means that she's going to tell you the truth. Interesting. Well, let's take a look. All right. 
My dad and I don't really talk. We don't have a relationship. My dad has told me to go myself. I hate you. You're such a bitch. Nobody wants to hear that from their dad. Andrea has brainwashed our kids. Mackenzie jumped on the bandwagon and joined a side. When my dad gets really angry with me, he'll send me these just nasty text messages. I have always been the target. It's always just made me really sad that my dad always seems to love my brother and my sister more than he loves me. My sister's an athlete, and I think, you know, deep down, he just appreciates my sister more. My brother's his only son, so that makes my dad appreciate my brother more. I'm just the that calls him out on everything. You say she was brainwashed, and you're going to say she doesn't care about you, but yet she wanted to get you help, right? The truth is, in, in one reality, you have no idea how much I appreciated her writing in, except for the method operation. I don't like people going behind my back. And yes, I've said some things to her, absolutely. And, and there is no excuse for those. Zero. Have and you I've grabbed her by the throat? Here. I have never, ever grabbed her by the throat. When she was 12, you didn't grab her by the throat? Absolutely not. So what happened? He was, you know, messing around, just harassing my brother in the doorway. My brother was brushing his teeth. And, I can remember that. And he, was, and he was little, and I wanted to defer the negative attention and put it on myself. And when I did, he blew up. He just snapped. I've never put my hands on any of my children. But you don't remember it. That's my the wife thing. Or anyone Not for that the matter. way you are right now. You, no, never. I'm, Dr. Obviously, Phil, he's I'm the not most... going to dive across the stage and tackle you. I've never, ever put my hands. Have I ever put my hands on you? No, Dr. Phil, okay. when he's so, in his right mind, he is the most gentle, loving man. Under the influence of alcohol, it's a whole different game. He's, that's so unfair and untrue. I'm the same guy. You decided to stop Do you change when you drink? I do not. Okay, well, here's a couple of snippets of you being recorded when you were drinking. Okay. I'm not going to sit there and listen to that and have somebody sit there and talk behind me when I'm not even in the freaking room. You're scared, bro. I'm scared. Yeah, I'm not scared enough to punch you in the face. Why would you talk to him like that? And this is how Andrea says Richie commonly speaks about Mackenzie to the rest of the family. She tried to take me down. I hate her. I can't stand her. I'm telling you right now, as I sit here, I'm done with her. Hey, Andrea, you want to come back to the room? Yeah, you want to come back to the room? You're talking about your daughter. Sad, isn't it? It's very sad. And this was you right after... You can't tell me that's how you really feel. No, I don't. I, the, the, the love, the blood, the, the that, I do. Yeah, but love but has I don't, I don't it. like her. I don't like her because she's the most entitled, narcissistic, selfish child that I have ever been around. And this was right after... Well, a, hell, a, you raised her. I tried to raise her and got undermined. There's a difference. I've had a job since I was 15 years old. I pay for college on my own. Um, That's I not have... true. That is so entirely no, true. No, your mom used at to send you money had, every when month. When I was at the university, I had four jobs at one point. I've never felt entitled, ever, in my when whole life. When he would talk about Mackenzie, it was almost like he would be talking about himself. When we come back, I've got what I think is um, an outcome-determinative, life-changing question for Richie after the break. Coming up. They say the police have been called 20 times. No way. 20 times. I would I say would, you couldn't right count them on one hand. Tomorrow on an all-new Dr. Phil. They said your gun was matched to the bullets found in those cars. There's no way that's possible. They're saying we still believe he's the freeway shooter. That's tomorrow. My dad will drive when he's drinking. It is amazing to me that my father has no DUIs. My dad definitely thinks that he's invincible. He thinks he can just drink forever and everything's gonna be okay. And I don't think that he's come to terms with the fact that it's just not going to be okay. I don't know if you've noticed, but I've basically kind of been defending you here a lot. 
I don't know if you've noticed that. I've been saying, you're not an evil guy. You're not a bad guy. You're not, I mean, they're saying you're doing bad things, and I'm saying th that may be, but you're not a bad person. I think I know what's going on with you, but you lack insight here. You're not able to see because of the depression, because of the alcohol, whatever. I don't know. You don't have a, an ability to see yourself the way you would see someone else. You've watched probably 2,400 Dr. Phil shows. What would you be saying right now if you were watching the show and I was talking to Bob right now? What would you be saying about Bob if he was saying everything you're saying right now? Denial, Isle, but I don't believe that's the case. That's so, right, because okay. you don't have insight. I don't live my life as a drunkard. Yeah. Here's what they say about your drinking according to them. They say around 3 o'clock you start drinking. They say the police have been called 20 times. No way. Back in 2007? 20 times. I would I say would, you couldn't right count right. them on one hand. That's how big a difference this is. That's okay. Have you been drunk at high school graduations? No. Have you been drunk at Mariah's soccer game? No. Were you drunk at Christmas to the point that you couldn't open gifts? No. Were you passed out in a lawn chair at Halloween? I certainly was. That's the last time I can remember getting drunk. But yes, I was. I most certainly was. You failed at alcohol rehab? I've never been to alcohol rehab in my entire life. Dr. Phil is going to say it was for depression. The rehab place said it was for depression. Yeah, they thought it was for alcohol. Because I told them if, it, if, if it's going to be turned into this direction, then I'm not going to, I'm not going to yeah. go. I'm not going to waste your time. Did, did you go on a double date and fall over your head in a plate? No, I don't recall that. That's my answer. None of this stuff's happened. Police haven't been called. No, the police have not been called 20 times. That's an out and out right lie. The okay. Halloween I admitted to, that's true. Did your father beg you to stop drinking on his deathbed? Not his deathbed, no. He was concerned about it, yes, is my answer. If you want me to quit drinking, just tell me and I'll quit. It's not that big a deal. But I'm just not going to, I'm not going to be railroaded. I'm not going to be overtaken by someone who has ulterior motives. You say, you want me to quit drinking? I can quit drinking. Okay, I want you to quit drinking. Okay. Quit drinking. Okay. Stop. Don't ever take another drink. Got it. Do you need Dr. Phil's help? Text Phil to 88500 and share your story for a chance to appear on the show. Standard message and data rates may apply. We can't do this show without you, our studio audience. If you are going to be in the Los Angeles area and you would like free tickets, go to drphil.com and click on Be in the Audience. Because we have a lot of fun here, don't we? Or you can call 323-461-PHIL. That's 323-461-7445. I think there's no doubt, in my opinion, this is just based on what I've seen and heard. I haven't done a thorough diagnosis of you, but I'm telling you, I do think that you have a, a chronic depression right now. I think that that chronic depression is what is endogenous. It's coming from the inside out. It's not reactive. At this point, it's coming from the inside out. I think that... In addition to that, you have a problem with alcohol, and I don't know whether you're addicted or whether you're not, uh, but I think that you have an alcohol dependency because you are self-medicating. And what happens when you have this and this, then what has happened is you have hijacked the pleasure centers in your brain. You say, oh, I, I can quit. I, you know, just, just tell me, you want me to quit drinking? Well, ask them. They'll tell you. You say, you want me to quit drinking? I can quit drinking. Okay, I want you to quit drinking. Okay. Quit drinking. Okay. Stop. Don't ever take another drink. Got it. That won't fix your problem. 
I didn't think so because I've already, I'm smart enough to have tried that one. Yeah. I turned every stone over. I think you read that in your notes. Yeah. You, you've got a situation here that, as you know, is known as dual diagnosis. You've got comorbidity here. These things are so intertwined that until you unravel all of this, I could treat your depression and you could keep drinking and it wouldn't fix the problem. You could quit drinking and not deal with your depression and it wouldn't fix the problem. I want you to go into treatment. I want you to go into a dual diagnosis treatment program. And I want you to go to a psychoneuroplasticity center and get your brain where it needs to be. I want you to do a multi-stop treatment plan here. I want you to go to the PNP Center in Dallas. I want to get your brain scanned. I want to get everything figured out neurologically. I want you to go to a dual diagnosis treatment center that deals with alcohol, deals with depression, deals with anxiety. I want you to have a life coach. I want you to declare some things. I want you to figure out what you want to do. That's how I let my dad down, and I blame nobody but myself. Well, but you, it, you've only let your dad down if you quit while you're behind. This is it. This is that bottom of the night. You got to do this. Ready to get real? Go to drphil.com for advice on relationships, parenting, finances, and more. Plus, weigh in on your favorite episodes, share your stories, and find support in the Dr. Phil community. When you sign up for the community, you will automatically be subscribed to the Dr. Phil Show newsletter. Log on to drphil.com today. You know, Richie has touched a lot of people throughout his playing career, including my next guest. This is someone who has known Richie for a long time. He's had to put it together after sports also. And he says back in the day, this guy was a stud on the mound. He had a big personality. He loved to make people laugh. When he heard Richie wasn't laughing so much anymore, I called him because he's a friend of mine as well. He dropped everything to be here today. Please welcome my friend and Richie's college teammate, roommate in the NFL and Major League Baseball superstar, Deion Sanders. <laughs> I love you, man. Oh, dude. It's okay. I got you, baby. I love you, man. Y'all have a seat. <sighs> Dion and I have been friends for a long time. And uh, when we called him and told him you were coming here and that you were struggling, depression stuck in your life and said you needed some help, he said, just tell me when. I'll be there. I'm broken right now, Dr. Phil. Because I know what he is. He don't understand what he meant to me. He was the best pitcher in the country. He was the life of the team. What I've been seeing today is a shell of what he is. This is it. This is that bottom of the ninth, man. They calling you out the pen. You got to do this. You got to do this. I'm blessed to be here. I was raised by an alcoholic father. I know when, when your dad is subject to being drunk, I, I know what that's like. I know you don't bring your friends home. You, you don't bring your friends home because you don't know what you're going to find when you open the door. I brought friends home one time in the sixth grade in Denver, Colorado in February, and my dad was asleep on the driveway in his underwear with his pillow, and it was 24 degrees out. And I walk up with six friends. You know, what do you say to your friends? I, I, I get that. And I know this. It takes a thousand Atta girls to erase one of those, you're a worthless bitch. 
I know that. I, I know it takes a thousand attaboys to erase one of those I want to punch you in the face. But I also know that you know in your heart that there's two different realities to who he is. And what I'm asking you to do is to take a leap of faith based on what I'm telling you. I want you to go to the PNP Center and get a neurological workup in, in your brain. I want you to go to Origins, which is an alcohol rehabilitation center. It's not a depression rehabilitation center. It's an alcohol rehabilitation center, but it is a dual diagnosis treatment center. They deal with depression, confounded by alcohol, and really confounded by the neurological aspects of what's going on in your brain. T.J. Howard is here. He's the director of Origins Behavioral Center. Say hello, T.J. I've already talked to Dr. Frank Lawless at the PNP Center. This is our gift to you. Deal? Deal? Can you have visitors in Dallas? Fair enough. We got a deal? Yeah. Dion? Appreciate Thank you, you man. Thank I appreciate you. it. I want to thank all my guests today. A very special thanks to Dion Sanders for coming here today and supporting his man, Richie. Also, thanks to T.J. Howard and Origins Behavioral Health Care and Frank Lawless at the PNP Center. We'll see you next time.